start the uh, recording. Wait, wait for it to come on. It takes a few seconds. Yes. Mary, what was the date of the last minutes that we we're approving tonight? I don't have it written down. I could probably look it up too. That's July 29th, Bob. Thank you. Because you have it on the agenda to approve them, correct? Yes, I was doing something else when you asked, so I'm sorry for the delay. That's all right. Hi, Phil. Good evening. I'd like to call the Frontier Regional School Committee to order at 502. For anybody that's not a school committee member or administrator, if you can mute and shut off your video so the committee people can come onto the screen. But when you're able to, you know, if you have a question during the chat and stuff, that'd be fine. Also tonight, uh, if you want to speak during public comment, which is going to come up pretty quick, um, just write in that you want to speak and Scott Dredge will, will call you and we'll speak uh, when we have the public comment. Also tonight, um, keep your comments to yourself. The chat is only if you ask, ask to be spoken to. I have a question. If you have a letter that you sent to all the school committee members, we, we don't want to hear, we already, all of us already read the letters. Most of us have, or all of us have, including myself. But if you want to add a little something, you're more than welcome to speak. You'll have a three minute time limit. And um, I think that's about it. I may repeat myself as people come on, but um, but that's what I could tell you. Um, so the first thing we'll do, we'll approve the minutes from uh, July 29th. Move to approve, Mr. Chair. Second. Second. They, were very, they were very good. Was that you, Lynn? Yeah. Second. Okay. Roll call, Lynn. Yes. Damien? Yes. Misty? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Bill? Yeah. Yes. Olivia? Yes. Mary? Yes. Judy? Yes. Keith? Yes. And Phil, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes, came on. I'm last yeah. as a school committee member. So. Bottom. You're on the bottom. Me? Um, say something. Just. Yeah, I'm here. Except for the school committee member. We'll go, we'll go last. Um, let, the, let the public that we have out there, we got quite a few of them. But if you want to say something, just put it in the chat area. And then Scott Dredge will call upon you. And like I said, you have three minutes. Hey, Bob, can I have all the school committee people uh, mute their mics because we are getting feedback. So if everybody if everybody mutes during public comment, unless you're the person speaking, that would be great. Control D is the shortcut for that. Thank you. Scott, do we have any anybody having public comment? Yes, there's quite a few. I'm writing them down. Uh, the first person who's going to be speaking tonight will be Allison Walters, representing the FRTA, who would like to read a statement. Okay. Allison? Hi, everybody. Um, this should be three minutes, and uh, it's got a little two parts. Hi, hi, hi. Um, thank you, first of all, for letting me speak. Um, as president of the Frontier Regional Teachers Association, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the FRTA. Um, this is one of the most troublesome 
times facing this community, this country, and the world. And I would like to acknowledge how difficult the decisions that you will be making are. Um, but before reading the position and recommendation that we have voted for, um, I would like to state that one of our goals is to work with the school committee and the administration um, looking out for the best interests of all of our students and the health and well-being of our students, all of our staff, families, and the community at large. While creating, um, while not creating irreparable damage to this community, we do not want um, that to happen. We want to work um, together for the good of all and deal with these unprecedented problems that we are facing with this pandemic in the world. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read a statement um, that is a position that the FRTA has voted on. And um, please bear with me if I get nervous. The Frontier, Teachers, uh, Frontier Regional Teachers Association members and all educators across Massachusetts miss their students and are eager to resume, resume in-person learning as that is how education is supposed to be. However, our greatest collective obligation is to keep students, educators, families, and communities out of harm's way and to prevent a resurgence of COVID-19 in our community. We acknowledge that the Frontier Administration is working towards improving protocols to better ensure the health and safety of our students and staff. We are grateful that they have included us in committees to voice our concerns, have um, altered plans in response to our feedback and are taking action to solve these new challenges posed by COVID-19. The FRTA has polled its members a number of times this summer in regards to the district's proposals. On July 13th, when the district draft was proposal was first released, 57% of the members who responded felt uncomfortable returning with any uh, form of in-person instruction. The supplemental plan re released July 28th did not instill confidence in a majority of FRTA members who responded to a follow-up poll. As of August 3rd, the FRTA poll results indicate that 76% of the people responding favor a remote learning model for the reopening of this year. 70% of, of the members who took the poll felt uncomfortable or very uncomfortable returning to a hybrid model. The FRTA supports the continued development of a safe hybrid model However, due to the time constraints, critical safety issues, and the numerous challenges due to the fluidity of the information available, the hybrid model is not the best option to adopt at this time. Just as the state is phasing reopening based on public benchmarks, we ask that the Frontier District does the same based on local information. The majority of FRTA members believe that a remote start is the safest option for the health and safety of our teachers, staff, students, and their families. We encourage the school committee members to adopt the remote learning plan for the initial opening of the 2021 school year to ensure the health and safety of our school community, its students, and all of those who benefit from this public institution. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Pam, Sharon, you're on next. Pam? Initial opening of the 2021 20, school year to ensure the health and safety if of our school community, going, its, it's control D if and all of speak. those who benefit from this public institution. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Um, right. Thank you for allowing me Thanks, to speak Allison. this evening. Uh, my name is Pamela Sharon. I'm Pam, a high Sharon, school Spanish next. teacher at Frontier Regional School. I will be um, heading into my eighth year at Frontier, my 21st year teaching Spanish. I feel that one way that Frontier differentiates itself from other schools in the area is that we have an amazing working relationship um, between the superintendent, the administrators at our school, and all the way down to every single teacher and staff member. We're treated with respect and we're treated as the professionals that we are and therefore, I feel that we work really well together. Um, but one thing that is disconcerting to me that Allison pointed out is that when we were polled recently, I believe um, the end of July or the first few days of August, over 70% of the staff and teachers said that they felt very uncomfortable um, about attending uh, or participating in a hybrid model um, at our school. 
And we all know that we have the best interests of our students in mind at all times. I do not doubt that in any way for all of us on this committee and the school and so on. I know that students are at the forefront of this. Um, but let me say, as the cases continue to rise in Massachusetts and across the nation, um, I am very nervous about having us um, kids who have been quarantining since March and teachers um, for almost five or six months. We don't know what kind of numbers that we're going to be seeing. And certainly the numbers of COVID-19 will continue to rise. Um, the question should not be in our mind, what if a student or teacher is infected, but when? When will it happen? Because it's inevitable. Um, naturally, we can wear masks, we can follow protocol, and I'm sure that we will go through trainings to learn all these things. However, we are human, we, um, we make errors, and eventually someone is going to be infected. I just don't think as um, educators, it is our job to jumpstart the economy. I think our job is to educate students. Um, also, as they, I come to you as a parent tonight, um, my husband is also an educator. We work in two different school systems. Our kids attend two different public schools in Northampton, Mass. And our little cluster of four people that we see on a daily basis, we've been very good about quarantining, will go from four people to over 2,000 in just a few weeks. The um, exposure is exponential. It scares me. It keeps me up at night. I've been very anxious about this. Um, but when it comes to teaching and learning, I'm very concerned about how we're actually going to teach in our classes. Imagine with me, if you will, students wearing their masks, sitting six um, feet apart, hopefully, and not being able to move around the room, not being able to speak um, Spanish with their masks. Perhaps they can from six feet apart, but I am like, I'm used to having students um, speak together, doing group work, doing partner work, um, they come up to the board, they walk around. Um, I pride myself in my ability to teach in a proficiency manner. That just would not be happening if we started hybrid. Um, I think it would actually kind of traumatize the students, to be quite honest. I think it is much easier to go from um, a remote situation and then slowly ease into a hybrid situation as opposed to just starting with hybrid when we see how many cases there have been across the nation. So I am asking you this evening to consider a remote um, beginning to our school as opposed to a hybrid model, because I feel that as a teacher, an educator, a parent, someone in this community, that that is the best best route to follow. I'm not sure if my time's up. I certainly have more yes. to say. Is it up? Yes, yes thank you. I, I, I could go on. I know. Okay. So, <laughs> thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Okay, Blair, you're up next. Okay, thank you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And I'm I'm coming as, um, yes, as a teacher, but also as a parent um, and resident of the Frontier community. Um, and I think mostly what I would like to convey this evening is my experience in running um, my summer ESL program. And for the past um, six summers, I have, I've run summer enrichment programs and worked with our ESL students. Um, but this summer, um, not surprisingly, I had the, the need to modify my program and um, partly to, to continue the connections with my students, but also to see how they would respond to a hybrid model of instruction. So um, over the past three weeks, I've been conducting um, small scale, in person, safely distanced, um, with PPE in class instruction uh, with five students. Uh, and then, and that's been one day a week for three weeks, and then also um, doing remote teaching. So, um, you know, basically a, uh, a dipping a toe into a hybrid model, if you will. And um, I really wanted to see how they would handle it. And this is what I found. Um, over the course of the three in-person sessions, my students um, displayed behaviors such as, you know, masks below noses, masks below mouths, hands up underneath masks, wiping eyes, wiping noses. Um, and so noticing all this, it meant a continuation of stopping my instruction, correcting the behavior, leaving the room, sanitizing, washing, coming back, and I would estimate that um, 
again over the course of these three weeks and I was hoping for a learning curve and I didn't see one, I didn't get one. So, you know, the behaviors continued over these three in-person sessions. Um, I would I would estimate that I probably over an hour period taught 15 to 20 minutes of instructional time and then 40 to 45 of um, correcting behaviors. Um, and I think that my students um, nervousness and disappointment and fear and all of the emotions that go with, you know, what it means to um, be learning uh, in COVID and um, being constantly corrected and recorrected and that showed on their on their faces. Um, I think that we can all agree that teaching under, under a constant state of vigilance is um, far from an ideal way to learn and and to teach and to exist. Um, I think based on this, um, on this experience and on, on this, it, I mean, it kind of felt like an experiment, but it did give me some, some evidence that, that I think is really valuable and that I think is also really important for school committee members, my fellow teachers, my administrators, and fellow parents to know. Um, because I can say that as a parent, Seeing this behavior in students over this small amount of time makes me very, very uncomfortable. Um, and I don't feel comfortable sending my own child into a building where, where this is the norm. Thank you. And I do have more to say, but I will respect that three minute limit. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Kate. Thank you all. Thank you. Scott, before you do anything, just for new people coming on, that there is a three-minute limit on for speaking. Just try to keep it to three minutes. If it goes over a little bit, we're not going to punish you or anything like that. But there's probably a lot of people that do want to speak. So if we can just keep it to three minutes, I know it'd be great. Thanks. Next up is Maureen Collins. Maureen? Okay, I should have no problem with the three minute because I, when I'm nervous, I speak fast and I go up about three decibels. So I'm, I apologize in advance. I teach middle school math. I love teaching. I love my students. I love this administration. I love working with the people I work with. They're all really dedicated teachers. And I can't wait to get back into my classroom, but being in protective mode all the time for my kids, I don't think we're ready to return safely. There's close to 150 people in this meeting right now. We need to think about why aren't we in the Frontier Auditorium if it's safe. Even in the hybrid model, there's going to be more than this many people in a Frontier building in a day. I understand that there's a ton of adults out there who are working in controlled working environments and they're wearing masks and they're feeling comfortable. but. Being in a middle school or a high school during the change of class is more like being at a conference, bumping in everybody in the hall, um, or at the mall at Christmas time when the hallway's only half as wide. There's going to be a lot of kids. The teachers are going to have prolonged expo exposure to at least 60 kids in a day, and probably closer to 150 uh, in the hallways. Um, middle school students, <laughs> I'm not sure they're capable of walking down the hallway without hugging or poking each other. So we are constantly reminding them about appropriate behavior. I love working with this age. They're innocent, they're funny, they're lovable, but they just don't have the facilities to keep in line like we're asking them to do. Last year, a very bright student stood up in my class, walked in front of my standing fan and sneezed. My response was, oh my gosh, you couldn't have held that for two more steps to get beyond the fan. And then I asked if anybody felt like they needed to go wash up and I let them all go to the bathroom and we continue, continued with our math class a couple of minutes later. If that happens this year, I know it's gonna happen. They're gonna pull down their mask and then they're gonna sneeze. And then I actually don't know what I'm gonna do. In the hybrid model, um, the teachers are also, because the teachers' bathrooms are on the other end of the building, we're also sharing uh, two to three stall bathrooms with these uh, 60 to 100 kids will be uh, teaching in a day. I understand that teaching outside is an option, but I kind of 
as much as I love being outside, I thought over the years that we were trying to protect our kids and we are leaving our teachers and our students more vulnerable to dangers in the community if we're in a tent outside. We just installed all these security fob keys so that we'll be more safe in the building and now we're not gonna be in the building. Another thing, I'm a math head, and keep looking at the data. The data we see is the number of people who are testing because they're sick. They could have another six people in their family who aren't having any symptoms and they don't show up in the numbers. There are no statistics about how many kids are out there uh, with asymptomatic COVID. And they've been playing games together, they've been on beaches, they have not been all socially distancing. So um, I worry about that one kid coming into the school with asymptomatic COVID, we could start an outbreak. And I don't understand the rush to get to the building. I would understand a rush to get back to what it was like in last March, but that's just not what it's gonna look like. Having masks and sitting six feet apart, I don't know how I'm gonna help a kid with a math problem. I won't be able to sit next to them and work their way through it. They won't be able to work with each other. They won't be able to do any of the fun group activities that we always have in our classrooms. We tried to make math fun. It just doesn't sound like it's gonna be fun this year. So if we start remotely, it won't be like, it's in the, like it was in the spring. We're gonna make it better and we will be able to be face-to-face -face online with kids. They're pretty comfortable being online, much more so than any of us are. And I think it would be nice for us to be able to see each other's faces and communicate before we get into a hybrid model. So I urge you to consider starting the year with a remote model and transitioning to hybrid a little later when we have a, a more secure plan and when the numbers look a little better for our community. Thank you so much for listening and putting so much time into this very challenging decision. Thanks, Maureen. Dulcie, you're up next. Dulcie. Okay. Yep. Can you guys hear me? Um, okay. So um, my name is Kristen Dulcie Mascolo, but I go by Dulcie. Um, and I am also pretty nervous. <laughs> um, so um, I think we can all agree that the numbers in Franklin County are increasing. The data shows that. Um, and we've heard, you know, how this isn't the hybrid model is not going to be the same as in person, where I get to hug my students, where I get to have kids working in a lab together, hands on, touching the same, uh, you know, equipment. Um, so this is going to be different if we were to go to hybrid. Um, but I think what I really want to point out is like, what's the harm in going to the hybrid? And I would say that there is significant harms to going to the hybrid. We've heard from people about the health concerns and we know that kids can transmit this and we know that kids can get this and that this can be with them for life. So if you're talking about a 14 year old getting this infection and having symptoms that alter their life, it is the rest of their life. And we, we don't know we don't know. Um, and as a scientist, I don't feel comfortable. I teach eighth grade science. Um, I don't feel comfortable endangering a kid without the right information. Um, so there's that concern, the health concern. Um, the other concern is, right, the, I don't think the hybrid model is as effective as a remote model because we can do one on one, we can do breakout groups, we can have them sharing and pairing. Um, but what the problem is with the hybrid model is that you know, kids have different home lives and it's not equitable. It's different for them at home. And so the harm in going hybrid right now is that we're denying the reality that we're probably gonna have to go to remote at some point, even with our best intentions and our highest hopes, the data and pattern is there. If numbers are increasing, we're gonna have to go to remote. And if we don't do it now, we are going to lose, we're gonna have to go to remote as a reactionary rather than as something that we're prepared and spending time to do. We should, we need to work with the community and figure out ways to create supports for families because parents at home are, you know, they're not teachers. They're getting their kids on the computer is challenging, like, you know, providing that support. But we can work together as a community because this community, you know, this community is amazing, but we need time. And choosing the remote right now would give us that time so, you know, that we can be really successful at it and perhaps there are a population of students that are treated differently than the rest of the population. That happens all the time in traditional school. It, it's laid out in the hybrid plan. So let's have that now where we and work with the community so that parents can have support. Like 
figuring out ways to do that so that it can be done equitable and it's not just people who have resources that are getting the support and the things that they need. So I just really think there is a cost to going with the hybrid one. I know we want we want what we had. The hybrid model isn't that and it's and it's going to take us longer to get to that if we choose it. And we're going to endanger our struggling students more if we choose it now instead of remote. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. All right, next up, Max, Max Sherrill. Good evening. Um, uh, my name is Max Sherrill and I'm the band and choir director at Frontier Regional. I also live in South Deerfield. Um, and I first want to just thank the committee for the opportunity to speak and, and voice our feedback. Uh, and I also want to thank the administration um, for an incredible amount of work uh, over the summer trying to tackle a problem that is unthinkable, was unthinkable a year ago in reimagining our entire educational system while also solving a, a health and economic crisis. Um, I, I want to just try to draw in um, <clears throat> some to show how those there are people who are pushing for a hybrid and pushing for remote. I just want to show how we, we have a lot of common ground here. Um, everyone wants to be in person if it's safe. Everyone who's a teacher wants to be teaching in person if it's safe. And everyone, I hope, realizes that if it's not safe, we need to be remote. Um, so first, there's that. The second thing is I've noticed after watching a lot of these school committee meetings, both Union 38 and Frontier over the past couple of weeks, that there seem to be some misconceptions that keep coming up. They're addressed, but they come up again. Um, and one of them is the comparison of remote learning to the spring. The spring remote learning was not ideal, um, although I would say there were some heroic efforts by a lot of teachers to make it an exceptional experience for their classes by putting in countless hours well above and beyond what they were normally doing in the school day. Regardless, the fall remote learning, as the administration has already pointed out, will have a lot more structure. And remote learning in the fall will involve a class schedule every day, attendance being taken, grades being assessed, um, in addition to the fact that we're all going to have be coming into it with a lot of experience, having done it for months, um, having talked to colleagues, having thought about it all summer long, how can we do this better? And finally, if you choose remote tonight, we will have time. We will have time at the very beginning of the year to devote, uh, as teachers, our full and undivided attention to making an excellent remote learning platform. Remember that Redesigning curricula takes hundreds of hours. It's, I'm not exaggerating. It takes a long time to do it effectively. It's not a matter of just uploading a couple PDFs and hopping on Google Meet for a lecture. You need to create brand new activities that are effective online. We want our students to socialize. That takes time to plan activities where they can do that online. If we go hybrid, we stand the risk of running into uh, weeks of back and forth about what's safe and what's not safe that could eventually break down into remote anyway. It's just we've lost time to plan. That could potentially even be first day of school. We're all geared up for hybrid. We figured things out to a large extent, and then we have to shut down. And that will be a jarring experience, and that will be like the spring, where we are scrambling at the last minute to, to try to re-implement these things that we had put on the side table. Um, the second misconception is this idea, which I've just heard from the rationale, and I'm speaking at the Union 38 meeting, um, but it's the rationale that if we vote for remote, uh, it's sort of voting for remote for the full year. Um, and I don't think that should be how we view this. Uh, a vote for remote is to reopen with remote with the plan to continue to develop everything that we need for the hybrid model. Um, so again, I think um, we, we, we share a common goal. We want to be back in the building safely. Um, and uh, the, the, the real question is, what is safely? That seems to be where we aren't agreeing completely. Um, I think we need to be able to articulate clearly, and, and I don't think we can yet with what's in the plans. We need to be able to articulate, are we currently safe? What does safety look like? Um, what, what, means, what, what indicators mean we have to shut down? Um, and it's kind of the elephant in the room, but what is a comfortable risk level that we're willing to take in reopening a school building? Um, is one case too much? Is 5% acceptable? I mean, you need to have that conversation. I know that's a perilous one to have. Um, anyway, I, I thank you for the time and, and I would strongly encourage you to, to vote for remote tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Uh, Kelsey Crop, you're up. 
Hi, um, thank you. I'm Kelsey Kropp. I'm a school counselor at Frontier. Um, I echo many of the sentiments that my colleagues have uh, very eloquently expressed. Um, you guys are awesome. Um, I just I wanted to bring I wanted to bring up a sentiment that I've kind of been been hearing that that concerns me. That sentiment being, oh, it's not going to happen to us. There aren't that many cases here. We'll be okay. Um, and I wanted to remind folks that we do have 179 students whose home address is outside of our four towns. Um, and I'm going to real quickly, just just so that this is at the forefront of everyone's mind, it, it's not just our four towns. Um, it's Amherst, Ashfield, Belchertown, Bernardston, Buckland, Charlemont, Coleraine, East Hampton, Irving, Florence, Gill, Granby, Greenfield, Hadley, Hatfield, Lake Pleasant, Longmeadow, Millers Falls, Montague, Northampton, Northfield, Orange, Plainfield, Shelburne Falls, Springfield, Turner's Falls, Wendell, and Williamsburg. So those are all communities that our school has students in. So those are all communities that our hybrid model will be linked to. And that's just students, that's not staff. I live in East Hampton, for example. Um, so we need to be conscious of the fact that when we're making these decisions, looking at just our four little towns isn't an accurate picture of who is in the building and what that risk looks like. Um, and as a school counselor, I also wanna to speak to the mental health aspect of this, that yes, remote learning is very difficult um, in terms of isolation, in terms of social withdrawal, but you can't learn when you are anxious. You cannot learn when you have racing thoughts and when you're hypervigilant. You can't teach when you're anxious and have racing thoughts and you're being hypervigilant. And I think the stress of coming into an environment that doesn't feel like a regular school day, it's going to feel very strange where you can't talk to your friends, you can't be close to your friends, your teacher is anxious and correcting you and everyone, you know, policing masks and it's, it's not going to be a relaxed, uh, learning environment. And I don't think that the focus is going to be on learning. I think the focus is going to be on safety because that is going to be, um, that's going to be the things on everyone's mind because this is happening in our communities. And as my other colleagues have said, when we're thinking about risk, we're thinking about students, we're thinking about kids and the rest of their lives. We know that this virus has lifelong impacts. We're seeing people who never get full function of their lungs back. What if that's one of our athletes and they can never play their sport again because they just, their lungs just don't allow them to exercise like that anymore. Uh, we're seeing long-term neurological damage. Like what, when we're talking about risk, please remember that we're talking about potentially a risk to a student's, a student's well-being for the rest of their lives. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thanks, Kelsey. Polly Wozni, you're up next. Thanks, Scott. Um, good evening. My name is Polly Wozni, and I'm an eighth grade math teacher at Frontier. At this time, I'm not going to speak about the letter I wrote to the school committee, which detailed very, many similar things that Kate Blair spoke about um, with my experience with in-person reading. But rather, I'm going to talk about the actual plans themselves. First, I ask you, what are the actual plans for remote hybrid full that you are voting on? The reason why I ask these questions is because I was always told by my dad that when you agree to something in writing, be sure that you know what you are agreeing to. Agreeing to. Remember, something in writing will stand up before what you are told. So from this point of view, I have taken a lot of times to go through the documents presented with regards to the three plans. I have read, reflected, and read again, and I struggle to see how the hybrid plan, the way it was written, would ensure the safety of anyone. You see, another hat I wear with my colleagues in the middle school is the hat of the one that can see schedules and the one that can make them work. As the schedule is written, I cannot see... I cannot get the students into the building with a safe six foot distance. I cannot get students to take a mass break outside the building with only 10 minutes. And I cannot get four 55 minute core classes, two exploratory classes, two mass breaks and lunch to fit into the day that goes from 745 
a.m. to 2.15 p.m. with the necessary safety precautions. I have made pictures of the halls, the classrooms, the exit doors. I have used different doors for different classes. I have determined the average walking rate of the person, which is 3.1 miles per hour, which actually breaks down to about 4.5 feet per second. I have tied knots and ropes six feet apart and made my husband walk with me so I could time how long it takes to walk the distance with a group of 10 students or to move up a flight of stairs. Through all of this, I cannot get the plan to work. I know it, st it states that it is simply it is a sample schedule and the final may differ from the sample, but how much will it differ? The definition of sample is a small part of quantity intended to show what the whole is like. I cannot see how the sample will be anything like the final schedule. First, if you look at the plan, there is no plan for how the students arrive at their first class. Do they just enter as soon as they arrive or do they enter when the bell chimes 7.30 a.m.? Or do we need a system in place that allows controlled entry into the building? Then if you read the notes for J period, it reads when more than one team is in the building at the same time, one team dismisses at 8.45, the second team dismisses at 8.48, and the third team dismisses at 8.51. How is this going to work when there are two classes in the same wing from the same team? We dismiss at the same time. How do we keep the distance? How can you get students out of one classroom in order for a new class to enter the classroom and do this for four classes when you only have three minutes? I will tell you that before we had the required safety guidelines, we could not dismiss all students at the same time, have them retrieve the necessary materials for the next class, and then get to the next class in only three minutes. Yes, we had some that could do it, but we didn't have all. Then we move to the mass break at 8.45, and it's only 10 minutes, and included in that 10 minutes is the time to get everyone outside. We cannot just move outside at the same time. There are four classes per team and only three exits. I use the exit at either end of the D-wing and the superintendent's entrance. Plus, I assumed no one else is using these entrances, not to mention we have some of the same team members in rooms side by side. For example, the grade seven teams has three rooms in the same hallway. Um, according to this plan, there are 55 minutes of core classes but time, but there is really, is there really? I tried simulating this plan to keep four 55 minutes and everything in place with the guidelines and we would be in school until um, it was dark. When I simulated these plans with the safety protocols to last from 7.45 a.m. to 2.15 p.m., I had only 15 minutes in classes. So what is the in-person model? What is the purpose? Provide students with education in English, math, science, history, et cetera, or is it something else? So I ask you, are you voting on the plans as stated when you vote tonight? And if not, what are you voting on? Thank you, Polly. Thanks. JJ, you're up next. JJ Cheney. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin or JJ Cheney. Uh, I teach science and math at Frontier Regional School. Um, first of all, thank you for letting me speak. I really appreciate it. Oh, I set a timer for myself. Um, I'm going to mirror a lot of what my colleagues have said as well. Uh, I do want to expand on a couple a couple things. First of all, I want to state my position. I, I am urging the committee to vote for a remote start to the year. Um, and I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about data and I want to talk about testing. Um, in terms of data, we all know that the cases in Massachusetts are going up. It's been in the news. Governor Baker has addressed it. Um, this morning, however, I did see some Department of Public Health data that came out yesterday. Every two, or I'm sorry, every Wednesday, they, they put out a, a list of all the towns in Massachusetts in the positivity rates by town. Four, the top four positivity rates in Massachusetts currently are in Western Massachusetts. Um, they are, two of them are in our, or one of them's in our district officially, Waitley is number number three or four at a positivity rate of about 7.1. Um, the second one, or it's either second or third is uh, Charlemont, which has a roughly the same positivity rate. So this myth, this idea that I've heard people say, well, we don't really have COVID out here. We're in Western Mass, it's kind of not our problem. It actually is our problem, and it does actually go along with the national trends uh, that that uh, Deborah Burks has told us about. How it's this is a virus that's leaving the metropolitan areas and it's going out into the rural areas. It's happening in our state as well, so it is definitely here. Um, another thing I want to talk about in terms of data are the data that we're not getting. Uh, the Boston Herald reported three days ago on August third that Desi, um, by admission of their own spokesperson, is not tracking school data for COVID. They have no formal process whatsoever. That is very frightening to me as, a, as an educator. 
Uh, it's frightening to me as a parent as well. I do have two children of my own um, who will be home this fall. Um, I don't know why that is, and that, that is very discouraging to me. The second thing I want to talk about is testing, um, or more accurately, the lack of testing, the lack of fast, reliable, immediate testing. Um, if you ask people around the area how long it took to get a test back or test results back, you hear anything from 48 hours up to 10 days. That is not acceptable because testing and tracing are the only two. Those are our eyes and ears on this virus. There are 30 to 50 percent cases are asymptomatic. Many cases are pre-symptomatic. If they're in our building and we start to see people who are sick, that's when we're going to know we have a problem. It's essentially, without testing, our plan is to go back into the building until people get sick. Um, as an educator, as a parent, as a community member, this is not something that I'm comfortable with. Uh, I think we can do better. I think we need to start the, the year safely until better testing is available. Governor Baker's working on it. Uh, he just signed up with six other governors from different states and they're, they're trying to purchase some tests. I understand they're rapid antigen tests. I don't know how accurate they're gonna be, but it is something in, pro in progress. I think it would be really um, wise of us to wait and see if that can happen. That could help us go back in safely. My time is up. Thank you all very much for listening. I appreciate it. Justin, thank you. Holly Johnson, you're up next. Hello, I'm a parent and I'm the co-chair of, of the district CPAC. Um, I'm not gonna read or say anything as far as my personal feelings. I've sent enough letters to school committee for my personal feelings. I'm just gonna give a statement on behalf of the CPAC. And we are really concerned that there isn't much of a plan for our special education students, the students that need to be prioritized according to DESE. Um, I've been to planning meetings, I've talked to administrators, I don't see a cohesive district-wide plan or contingencies no matter what plan you pick tonight. Um, so I'm urging that this committee follows up and ensures that our most vulnerable students are taken care of according to the DESE guidelines, that all students who qualify for high priority are given that high priority for in-person instruction. No matter what you pick and what those children get is not based on what you pick tonight. They are prioritized regardless. And we would like you all to keep that in mind, please. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Chris Leonard, you're up next. Chris? If you're trying to talk, Chris, control D on your computer. We can always come back to Chris, I guess. Yeah, Scott. I'm gonna go, go to uh, Ashley Dennis now. Ashley? Coming. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> well, yeah, I got there, you got there faster than I expected. I was gonna be ready. Um, I want to thank everyone both for the opportunity to speak even more so for the incredibly hard work that everybody is doing. Committee members, thank you. Our entire staff, administration, parents, we have all been in this throughout the summer. It's a big deal. Um, Holly, I want to emphasize you're absolutely right. Our highest needs um, students, our high need student population is go, it has specific guidelines that apply to them that are different than our, that are, that are additional to our general population students in this case. And that's really important for us to realize. Um, I have a, I have a number of concerns ultimately to, to start with, I really want to urge, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm a school nurse at Frontier and I have a student in eighth grade. Sorry, that's relevant. Uh, my history is working in the operating room where um, before being a school nurse, that is all sterile technique. Professionals in the medical field are trained from the get-go in how to manage this. So where we're talking about, well, doctor's offices are doing this and dentists, orthodontists, et cetera, that's very specialized training. Our teachers are not medical professionals. So that is important to remember. While certainly we can learn, we're talking about a really fast startup here with the hybrid plan. 
I am concerned about the social emotional impact to our students of returning to school in person in such an incredibly different environment of distance and masks and um, strict oversight. And these are teenagers, their frontal cortex, they're not developed, they're, they're not done. This is not, this is, um, I also think there's a really significant social emotional impact for us to consider about if we start, if we start hybrid and then switch pretty soon to remote, that's going to engender a lot of, I think, fear, a lot of scared, a lot of tumult. It worries me the impact of that quick switch. Um, clearly remote will not be like the spring. It cannot be like the spring. And we've already had the dry run, not dry run. We've already had the run. We did it. We've improved. We've evaluated. We've replanned. We should use the rest of our time between now and the start of school to really nail down those important aspects of a robust and thorough remote plan. And really with the hybrid plan, how much benefit are we talking about, about being in person? If we're talking about, you know, the teachers are not going to be able to use their best modalities. The students aren't going to be in their best learning mode. There's going to be so much time lost to monitoring safety and health protocols. What are we going to get? 10 minutes more a day kind of thing? I don't think it's worth it for the risks. I also am very concerned that a parent Mm, Lee, just finishing the sentence, please. Apparently, the plan is for students to move from classroom to classroom. What cleaning protocols will be happening between the between those shifts? That's a very significant concern. And I'm re-upping my mental health practice insurance because of all of this. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Ashley. We're, uh, we're going to go back to Chris Leonard. I think she's ready now. Chris? Hi. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to turn the camera on because I'm having internet stuff. So thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I'm a middle school teacher at Frontier, but today I'm speaking as a parent who has a child, a teenage son who has been diagnosed with COVID. 18 weeks ago, my son Luke's toes swelled up. He had blisters. They his toes turned purple. He was in intense pain. He was unable to walk. He couldn't even sit up. He couldn't sleep. The doctors didn't know what was going on. And after being in pain for almost four weeks, without any idea what to do, he was admitted to Bay State for three days of testing, where I had to drive up, drop him off, and drive away because I couldn't go in with him. During that time, he saw several specialists and was finally diagnosed with COVID codes and presenting as urethromyalgia. He was given medicine to try, and things slowly improved, and it's, he would be able to be on his feet for an hour, and he could use the stairs. The blisters disappeared, but he was still having pain, especially at night. The doctors were hopeful things would improve. In the beginning of July, Luke got, Luke got a new pain. He got, on his pain on the bottom of his feet became so intense that he was unable to stand in front of the refrigerator to get a glass of milk without having a chair there for him to sit down on. Um, he went back to the doctors. They did a bunch of tests. They didn't know what was going on because he no longer had the symptoms of urethromyalgia. They didn't know what was going on. In mid-July, he was um, referred to Dr. Esther Freeman at Mass General, who has been the leading doctor on diagnosing and treating and looking at researching um, COVID toes. Luke was admitted into his, her study. He is now receiving PT physical therapy three days a week. He's on a whole bunch of new meds. When we ask how long this will last, we don't get an answer. <laughs> when we ask what the long-term effects are, we don't know. What they do know is that Luke at some point was exposed to the virus four to six weeks before the, the symptoms showed up. Um, but he had no symptoms, so it was sometime in mid-February. He's one of the, or the, the longest cases they had. And they also know that COVID toes affects teenagers. My son is a six-foot-four pitcher. He's an athlete. Before this happened, he was working out four days a week, and he was going to, to practice two days a week. 
Today, he can't walk down the driveway. Some people say that only a small percentage of kids get sick. But if it's your kid, it doesn't matter how small. What you really worry about is that your kid's in pain. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Next up is Sarah Colsey. Hi, everyone. Um, this is kind of a hard point to make after Christine. Um, and Christine, I am truly sorry for what has happened with your son. And I hope for the utmost full recovery for him. Um, I am a parent also. I have two boys. I have one who is entering sixth, sixth grade at DES, one who is entering ninth grade at Frontier. These last six months have been extremely hard on my family. When COVID hit and the school shut down, we were scared. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what to do. My husband and I both still had to work. Um, we both have two jobs. My husband works for UPS and for a hospital. I have been delivering groceries and food to all sorts of residents of Franklin County. Everybody from the very young to the very elderly. In March, when everything happened and the lockdowns happened, essential workers like us were put on a pedestal, a pedestal we didn't want. I hate the term essential workers. I think every job, every job is essential. But people rallied together. This community was very much in this fight together. We all wanted to do what was best. When the two month, or I'm sorry, two week lockdown extended, we still rallied together. We still were all there for each other. In May, I saw a drastically different scenario in this world. Now, mind you, my husband and I have worked six to seven days a week, every week. In May, in particular, when the mask mandates took place, and I'm not saying that it is because of the masks by any means, please don't get me wrong. But when the mask mandates took place, the world drastically changed. People who were extremely friendly, who were rallying behind others, almost overnight turned mean and in some instances, violent. The lockdowns I watched have a massive impact on our community and not just people out and about, but my own children. I watched a lady at Big Y one day scream at another lady because her pocketbook was too big and that it could be carrying COVID and she just infected everybody. I myself have personally been verbally attacked and physically attacked. Being outside, God forbid, without a mask. Mind you, I was six feet from people. I was nowhere near anybody, but I was called a B word and I've had a bottle thrown at my head. And again, as I've said, my husband and I are what we are deemed as essential employees, essential workers. Remote learning was horrible. I'm sorry. I know. I know the staff and faculty did their best. And please, I am not belittling or saying anything bad about the staff. I love our community and I love our staff at the schools. But it was horrible. My, at the time, fifth grader, had had multiple teachers helping him with the remote learning, but he didn't want to do it. He did not want to be on a computer. I had to physically drag him to that computer for him to learn. He won't do it. And I know there are other children that won't do it. They are active children. They don't want to be home. They don't want to sit behind a computer all day. My eighth grader, he did better. But out of all of his teachers, and again, please, I am not saying anything bad about teachers directly, but out of all of his teachers, there was one, one that I had a lot of communication with, Ms. Wozni, who spoke earlier. And I am extremely grateful to her because she kept me apprised of everything that was going on so that I could help Ben as much as possible. But from a parent's standpoint, and I, I know, Scott, I'm almost done, from a 
parent's standpoint, remote learning, when you have two children in two different schools and you have two jobs, is not a feasible scenario. I truly, truly hope that you look at every single person's different scenario. I know it's tough, but my family really hopes for hybrid. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Melissa Strelke, you're up next. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm prepared a statement because I'm very nervous. Um, I want to start by thanking the school committee for all their diligence and committed hard work during these unprecedented times over the past few months. I am a high school English teacher at Frontier to which I have been warmly welcomed over the past six years. We have an amazing team of students, staff, parents, and community members who make Frontier a thriving and innovative learning space. Every day I walk into the classroom, I cannot wait to engage my students in activities that call for movement, working closely in pairs or small groups, or circling up for a critical discussion of a text. There is nothing more in the world I would love than to return to this energizing dynamic built on inquiry, joy, and love. However, we know this is not the world we'll be able to return to in September. Just in the past week, Massachusetts has seen a 146% jump in cases, moving both Massachusetts and more specifically Franklin County classified as a high risk for spreading infection, already making the data shown from last week's New York Times article on Tuesday's meeting out of date. As of today, the infection rate in Franklin County is higher than it was at the beginning of April. Leading epidemiologists in Massachusetts this week are also warning residents that a surge is coming. Governor Baker likewise threatened to pull back the state to phase two if this trend continues as it's predicted to do so. This startling data in combination with recent findings continues as it's, uh, uh, the startling data in combination with recent findings from the Chicago study show not only can young children transmit the virus as effectively as adults, but they may be the drivers of the pandemic as well with asymptomatic infection being common. Due to the increasing rates and limited state and federal measures in testing, tracing, and containment, we will be unable to see the success with reopening schools that we've seen in countries such as Denmark and Germany. The possibility of over 50 students rotating through my room each day with a growing infection rate is highly concerning. I feel as though I will be unprepared to mitigate all of the safety risks, especially with teenage risk taking that is developmentally natural and expected. Rather than attending to our students' social needs, we will be forced to diligently focus on enforcing safety protocols over the emotional well-being and academic engagement of our students. Instead, I want to start the year getting to know my students without masks or relentless, real and legitimate fear for their safety. For these reasons, I urge the school committee to vote for starting the year with remote learning and consider its potential to develop even more. As we have started to see in Greenfield with their remote learning plus model, starting with remote learning could open up the possibility of giving us the best start to serve all of our students and minimize risk. If we engage in this endeavor with creativity and innovation, as I have seen from this community, I'm confident that Frontier can create their own dynamic remote learning plus model such that students could have the opportunity to meet on school grounds and pods, prioritize the time and attention for high need students and provide supervised study groups, especially for students with limited internet access. Educators are hardworking and driven, especially when it comes to seeking creative ways to connect and educate our students. We have already spent countless hours over summer attending webinars, meeting with fellow educators, and piloting effective forms of online learning that looks nothing like it did in the spring. Students who choose to go remote would not lose their teacher, and the faculty and staff would be able to use the first 10 days prior to creating a robust online curriculum that focuses on students' emotional needs and building resilience. We will be ready to hit the ground running and start the year in such a way that allows for flexibility, minimizes risk, thoughtfully engages our students, and attends to the diverse needs of our community. Please vote for starting the year with remote learning so we can continue to innovate and collaborate to safely serve the needs of our families and facilitate a smooth transition into the hybrid model when it is safe to do so. I know this has not been easy for anyone in our community, and I thank you for your time and attention. 
Thanks, Melissa. Kevin Thompson, you're up next. Wow, you jumped me. I was like, okay, get prepped. I got the next one. Uh, my name is Kevin Thompson. I'm in Unit C. Uh, I am uh, an instructional assistant in the middle school life, goals, life skills class. I love my job. I love the people I work with. I love the kids I work with. My phone's going off. It's making me sad. Sorry. My biggest concern is that when we left in the spring, there were problems. It's hard to work with the special needs kids. We took time. I just finished the summer. Our program is a thousand times better. And if we can take this time and start moving towards doing more remote, it's going to be great by the time we get into the school year. But if we go back, my biggest concern is that for the last three years, I have been sick by week three of September and out for two or three days. And I don't want it to be because of COVID this time. Because if we, sorry, if we get sick and we're out, how many of us are going to have gotten sick simply because we had to force our way back into the building? It just seems to me, let's take the time, work the plan to try and do much better on remote, which we're already doing. And when we can get back safely, when there's testing available, when we know help, when we get a, a vaccine for crying out loud, I don't care, just making sure that we're doing it safely. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Stacy Chapley, you're up. Hi, thank you everyone for um, taking this time to, to hear our comments. Uh, my name is Stacy Chapley. I am a science teacher at Frontier Regional for the high school. I'm also a 30 plus year resident of the town of Deerfield. And I just wanted just a few comments um, in hopes that you will go remote with us being able to phase into a hybrid model when the numbers look better. Um, right now, as several of my colleagues have said, our numbers are going up. I just checked the numbers from the state. Mm -hmm. Deerfield has one case of positive COVID. Waitley has two. Sunderland has one. And I included Greenfield with six. I didn't include all the students um, that school choice in. Um, COVID doesn't discriminate based on age. It seeks out a host cell. Um, and we know with younger kids, it is asymptomatic. And until somebody within that small nucleus of, of a child, does a child most likely get tested? Um, that could be over 14 days. That could mean many, many contacts. That makes contact tracing very difficult. We have no protocol coming from the state or the federal government to do testing. Um, Deerfield Academy um, is going to be testing their commuting students every other day. And if need be, they're going to bubble them on campus. Um, and so without being able to test on a regular basis, there's no way of getting an early jump on being able to um, isolate and quarantine kids or adults in the building. These are all our kids. I see these kids two, three, four times throughout their um, time at Frontier. I am an avid supporter of the arts. I help out wherever I can, I go and support them when during doing their sports. And these are our kids. And the last thing I want to do is to see any child, any one of our kids becomes sick, whether it's mildly or long term. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. Diane Cassidy, you're up. Hi, yes. So I have um, a coming in seventh grader. Um, my son did attend the Next Step Up program in person for two weeks at Frontier. Um, he was a different kid. He was happy. He was excited. He had a light shining around him for being able to go to school, 
to see other children, even though he didn't know any of them. He didn't know the teachers. He didn't know the staff. He didn't know the school. But that boy was happy to be able to be back in school. My son was did very well in remote learning. He had his classwork for the week accomplished by Tuesday. But he lacked social interaction. And my son slowly disappeared. And he continues to slowly disappear with no social interaction. And my son's not an actual social butterfly. But to see him have no social interaction, no group work, um, no seeing staff or teachers or adults or being in the community besides going grocery shopping with me, he is disappearing. And it's scary. There are pros and cons to hybrid. There's pros and cons to remote learning. But for the sake of my son, the emotional and mental health of him, he's disappearing. And that isn't, that isn't safe. It isn't fair. Um, and my son is high risk for catching this. And I'm scared. But I can't be in fear my entire life for my son. I have to allow him to have a happy, safe, emotional and mental state as well as physical safety. And our staff, our teachers have always put our kids first. They've always kept them safe to the best of their abilities. There is nowhere that is safe from COVID. We cannot protect anybody 100%, but we have to start somewhere. Giving voting tonight for a hybrid option allows the families and the staff that feel comfortable to go in person. And it allows the other families that don't feel comfortable to do remote. But it gives each family the choice to make for what's right for their families. And to have that choice and to make that choice is better than to have that choice taken away from us. And I just want to say thank you for all of your hard work that you guys have put into all of this, no matter which option we go with. I just want to say thank you. Thanks, Diane. All right, Dodie Cullen, you're up. Okay, I'm trying to get the camera on. All right, I'm very nervous. Um, Miss Leonard made me cry, so it's, my eyes are all watery. Um, I... Um, I'm a parent of an incoming eighth grader and I also work at Frontier and I have been working in a nursing facility that has been COVID free this whole entire time. I want to say that I started out that I thought hybrid model was a good idea. My son did not do well with the remote learning. Um, and honestly, if it wasn't for Miss Leonard, I don't think he would have gotten any credit. Um, and then what changed my mind was when I heard um, in the Union 38 meeting that it's the parents' responsibility to teach the mask wearing. Um, I'm a nurse. My son wears his mask. He's taught to wear his mask. We went for a walk with the dog. Um, he had his mask on. I had my mask on. And he stopped pulled his mask off, sneezed, and then, you know, wiped his hand on his clothes. And I said to him, what are you doing? And he had no idea what he just did wrong. So I explained it to him and he said, well, it's gross to sneeze in my mask. So I ask you if we are taking this hybrid model and taking kids from one classroom to another classroom and COVID can live on those desks, I did my research, up to three days. How are we gonna disinfect in the four or three or four minutes um, that is left you know, between classes? So I know that um, the custodians, because I was trained on it because I am a special needs nurse and I use the chemical is has to be left on the surface for 10 minutes. You have to wear glass uh, goggles and gloves. 
So then I did a little more research and I looked at my own Lysol wipes and found that this whole time I've been using Lysol wipes wrong. So there's a little spot on the directions that says if you um, are using it as a disinfectant, it needs to stay on the surface wet and air dry, which could take up to four minutes. So that brings me to contact tracing as working as a nurse um, with infection control. Um, If a student in one group has tested positive for COVID, you can't really say that it was somebody in his, that student's group that they got the COVID from. If you're not disinfecting the desks the proper way, when you go into the next classroom. So I am just want to say that I was for hybrid. I am not now. I um, really think that we need to start remote and ease into a hybrid plan because I do believe my son for one needs to be in the classroom because he doesn't not do well. Um, And that's all I have to say. (laughs) Am I good? (laughs) Thank you. Hey, Zoe, you're up. Hello, um, I am Zoe Keenan. I'm the library media specialist at Frontier. Um, I want to thank you so much for letting me have the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, And I just kind of want to run through what I imagine my day would be uh, in the library with the um, hybrid plan. So I've been told that the library will be repurposed. for classroom space. Uh, So in the hybrid model, the library would now have three classes um, within it. Um, And I don't know if I will even be there because um, as things are, we wanna limit the amount of people who are in there. Um, And I don't even know if I'm, I haven't been told if I'm supposed to be in the building or not. Um, We are a staff of two in the library. Um, The schedule that I'm seeing um, in the hybrid model, there is no route, there's no instruction for how people are, how the buses are going to be run. Uh, the bus is only stated in the supplement um, for the hybrid model twice, but there's, uh, and, and that's just the word bus. Um, so I'm wondering how students are going to come in. The library on average houses, I open at 720 for um, kids who get dropped off early. Um, I open the doors and on average, I have 40 plus kids hanging out in the library almost every day. That's on average. Um, I don't know where they're going to go. So where are those 40 plus kids who I usually have, where are they going to go and where are they going to sit, you know, six feet away? Um, That's not stated in the plan. Um, The plan says we have five classes. um, That's going to be one cohort will will experience five classes. which means that the library itself is going to have 144 kids in, you know, over a whole day. So um, as of right now, we have 149 people um, in this meeting. So it, imagine all of them in one room. Um, and then we have four uh, blocks where we rotate because we're not rotating on every, um, uh, for every class. So we have four blocks that we have to transition to which means those kids are going to be in the common space and common areas. So um, that's where germs can happen. That's where like um, conversations are going to happen. Masks may come off. People will use the bathrooms, all that stuff. We're also going to have two mass breaks, which also puts them in the, in these common areas. So now they're back in the library after having uh, transition periods um, after mass transition periods and then lunch. Um, you know, if weather permits, will go outside. If weather doesn't permit, they'll be in the library. Um, how does that work? Because I'm a certified librarian. I've um, been doing this for 10 years now, 10 plus years. Um, and I just learned from Dodi uh, how to clean, how to, <laughs> you know, like how to sterilize um, uh, the tables. Now with all these transitions happening, how am I supposed to clean the entire library? Um, And how am I supposed to be reassured that I'm doing it right? Uh, 
because I don't want to endanger my students. I want the library to be a healthy, happy place. Um, and what I'm, I'm just, my, my statement to you guys is, is kind of what Max Cheryl was saying. How many, how, what's a comfort level that you guys want to risk? And it's students and faculty. How many people do we want to put at risk, especially if teens are showing these symptoms asymptomatic for four to six, or showing symptoms four to six weeks later, or asymptomatic? So I really urge you guys to vote for um, the remote plan. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you. Kate Johnson, you're up next. Hi. Uh, my name is Kate Johnson. I am a high school math teacher. I've been at Frontier for five years, but I've been teaching high school math for about 12. Um, I'm also a parent. I have three children on my own, so I know how challenging the fall was. And, and I had one kid who did well with it and one kid who did not. Um, like all of the teachers who are speaking tonight, I, I would love to be back in the classroom with my students, but I'm worried. I'm worried that even if our kids do a good job with PPE and we do a good job with cleaning, that the kids are going to get sick. And I think any plan that plans for what to do when kids get sick is, is not a good plan. Um, I'm worried that the hybrid model is going to force students and families to choose. It's going to force those who aren't comfortable to choose to pick the remote option. And that will take them out of my classes and put them on a different program that we don't know much about. It may take them out of an AP class. Um, I teach AP calculus. If my students don't have that option remote or if it's taught by videos and a computer, I'm worried about how they're going to get the support that they need. Um, I'm worried that if they do come back in the classroom, then I won't be able to teach them in any way that's effective. I won't be able to pair them up. I won't be able to put them in groups. I won't be able to pull up a chair when they're nearing the top of frustration because they don't understand why their answer is wrong and how to combine like terms. Um, if every time I want to give them feedback, I need them to submit something electronically so I can read it on my screen, wouldn't they be safer at home? Um, so I urge you to vote for remote plan tonight for you to give us the time to make that robust remote learning plan where we can address the concerns of our highest need students that the CPAC is bringing, where we can talk about social and emotional so the kids don't waste away um, I think if we have the time, we can do a really good job because this community is awesome. These teachers are great. Our administration has worked so hard. Um, it won't be the same as spring. I think that's where we need to start and then easy. So, thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Scott, you got a control D. Carrie Thurlow, you're up. Carrie. Hi, thank you. My name is Carrie Thurlow, and uh, I have two children who will be entering the seventh grade at Frontier, and they are children who live with a lifelong condition. Today, they are 12 years old, and they are autistic. When they graduate Frontier, they will be 18 and 19 years old, and they will become autistic, autistic adults. I am I'm in favor of bringing my boys and other high priority students into the into the school for as much in-person learning as possible. For me, remote learning over the spring cost me thousands of dollars, including computer screens, oh, including replacing computers because my children had meltdowns, because they became destructive because they became self-injurious. These are the children who you absolutely owe the duty of voting for a hybrid option to. It is, Desi has made it quite clear that individuals who are high priority, ESL learners, those with unique learning challenges, they need to be in the classroom to receive their learning in person as much as possible. It's not a matter of, I don't want my children at home on a remote plan. It's that I am not able to safely teach them while managing their behaviors and keep the rest of the five people in my house 
safe. So I need them to be able to get support from people who are trained in scaffolding a writing assignment or using certain methods to teach them math or to receive support when they need to access information because I can't even guide them through a Google search without them becoming verbally abusive towards me because I'm old, because I'm their grandmother and I don't know any better because when I went to school, we didn't have computers. I really need these kids and every, every parent in the CPAC needs their children to have that option and that alternative. My heart goes out to families who are experiencing COVID. My family has lost three members. I've lost an aunt, an uncle, and a grandfather because of this illness. I haven't been able to go to a single funeral. But I really need my boys to have the opportunity to grow their skills and learn. Right now, they're functioning at a fourth grade level going into seventh grade. And the longer they stay out of that special needs environment, the more skills they're going to lose. And unlike a child, a student who has typical educational challenges, you can go back and review and relearn once that window of opportunity closes for a child with a learning challenge, it closes for good. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Tim Guy, you're up next. Hi, Tim. Tim, control D if you're trying to talk. Oh, there you go. No, we can't hear you yet. Is it, is it, is it, and that's, I hear a baby now. That's him. There he is. Hey, hey guys, hear me okay? Everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me okay? We just turned it off. I, oh. We can hear you, Tim. Go ahead. It's not working. Now we can't hear you. Oh, can you, oh, can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? Okay. No, all right, sorry, can. sorry, thank. Um, all my. Okay, great. Thank you. I had to say thank you for on um, the school committee for letting. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Um, I just and my fellow colleagues, whole community for doing everything that we're doing. Um, during this very difficult time. Um, I don't really know how to follow up my fellow colleagues. Um. I just wanted to say that I've lived in this community uh, in South Deerfield since 1993. Um, I went to school, Frontier, and now I, I teach. I've, I've taught in the middle school and high school uh, history here at Frontier. There's no place I'd rather be. This is my home. Uh, I love it here. I just wanted to say a couple of things uh, briefly about that. I know three people personally who have gotten sick. Um, Maybe we can come back to him if he comes yeah, back. Yeah, we can come back. Um, I'll, I'll put him back in. Kurt Markle, you're up next. Um, hello. Uh, so thank you for giving me time to speak. Um, I'm Kurt Markle. I'm a math and physics teacher at Frontier. Um, first, I, well, I urge this committee to vote for full remote 
um, not just to start, but for the full fall semester. Um, most experts, they expect a large spike this fall moving into cold and flu season. Given the current delay between how this virus spreads and when it first becomes noticed, if we wait until we start seeing more cases, it will be everywhere and it'll be a problem. Um, in my letter to the school committee, I described why I think the hybrid model is too dangerous. I'd like to spend this time talking about, you know, why remote can work. Um, so I'm a parent of a two and a five year old boy and I understand parents' feelings about how this spring went. It was rough. Um, you know, it happened abruptly. It was, it was not great, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, you know, this, well, before COVID started this past year, I was actually teaching remotely. Um, you know, the committee allowed me to continue teaching my AP physics class this year while I was living in Washington, DC. Um, so we were working remotely. Um, long before this happened, and that was a successful experience. Um, my students, you know, they they scored higher scores than the state or the national global averages on the end of your exam. Um, the reason that worked is because I knew months ahead that I was going remote, and there was time to prepare and to think about what needs to be done and how to make that happen. Um, that's what's crucial here. I know parents do not want a repeat of the spring and that they're probably very afraid of going remote because they think that will happen. That happened because, you know, on Friday we thought we were teaching in class and then on Friday afternoon we were told Monday will be full remote. You know, if, if we decide tonight that it's going to be full remote, teachers have five weeks to prepare, students know what they're getting into, parents know what they're doing, that's the only way to provide the best possible learning experience. Um, if we go with a hybrid model, it is still most likely the cases are going to spike in the fall as all experts believe they will. The governor will remotely could tell all schools to close, will be switched back to remote, and it probably won't be as bad as the spring, but it's not going to be good again. It will still happen over a weekend. You know, students will have left things at school like they did. It's it's not going to work well. Um, you know, that's the problem. Now, I, I understand we do have a small percentage of students that probably need to be in the building. They have unique needs. Maybe those needs can't be addressed remotely. I'm not an expert of that. Um, you know, except for those rare cases, the dangers of students being in the classroom is very real. Um, you know, if we have everybody coming back in a remote scenario, you know, there isn't a, an expert in the country that doesn't say a school this size with this many people who spread between almost half of a reasonably densely populated state, it'll be bad. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Hey, yeah, uh, Tim, looks like Tim got back on. Let's let him finish up. Yeah, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Sorry about that. We can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I was just starting off by saying I just wanted to again thank the administration, my fellow colleagues, the school committee for everything you guys are doing. This is a historically uh, very difficult situation that we're all living in. And I, I just wanted to say that I grew up here in South Deerfield. Um, I graduated from Frontier. This, this is my home. Um, I have almost a one-year-old son now as well, who uh, I hope someday will go to Frontier as well. I just want to talk for a minute I, about, I know three people who have contracted COVID-19 personally. One of them has passed away, so I've seen kind of up close and personal what this can do. And I'm just very concerned about my fellow colleagues, uh, administration, people in the community, everybody, because I love this community, I, I truly do more than anything. I'm very concerned about just everyone's safety. And that's really what I care about the most. And uh, I know this is kind of short, but I just wanted to say, uh, I, I hope you will vote for at least to start the school year uh, for the remote learning until we get a better system in place for testing and contract tracing, because I, this is my home and I, I care about it more than anything. I don't want to see anybody get sick, parents, kids, uh, colleagues. Um, and uh, I just, again, thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. And um, 
yeah, sorry, I was kind of brief, but thank you again. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Phoebe Hines, you're up. Phoebe, you on? Hi. Sorry, I was just getting my computer ready. Um, I'm going to be reading from a document that I wrote. So hello, my name is Phoebe Hines. Um, I'm an instructional assistant. I work in the middle school and high school, specifically with the Special Education Alps program. I echo a lot of concerns brought up tonight. Um, so thank you for everyone for being vulnerable and sharing these very important ideas. Um, I've been dealing with chronic pain since I was 18 years old, and now I'm 23 on a journey to get diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. I'm considered higher risk in terms of COVID-19. This past year, I got sick seven times, and I believe this was due to working with students in such close proximity and working multiple jobs, and I can't do my job if I continue to get sick. I also work in a classroom with students with moderate to high needs. Um, I can't see my students wearing PPE consistently. Um, I can also, I cannot also see my students abiding by social distance rules consistently. I have students who don't always follow prompts about participating in activity immediately or where to sit in a classroom and sometimes get up and move around along with leaving the classroom entirely, even with prompting and um, prompting to not do so. So some of our students need help walking too, such as using an arm for support. Um, some of our students need help in bathrooms. These are just a few examples of how we work with the student population. IAs often need to be in very close proximity to their students to give in instructions or assist their students' needs. Um, and we need safe and effective learning. And I, I can't see it being in person with PPE and um, social distancing rules. Uh, being entirely successful. We also have been doing remote learning uh, during our summer program and it has been successful and I can only see that success growing in the fall. Um, our students and staff have been learning how to work with this technology and use it to our advantage. If we adopt a hybrid, this could be jarring for our students and will be a jump from what their routines have looked like the past few months. Um, routines and expectations being met can be crucial for my students' success. It will be very jarring to have to return to a hybrid model and then have the very, very big possibility of having to return to remote once again. Um, I understand these students are the highest priority and will get services that might be in person regardless of any of these three models we're exploring, but I want to raise these concerns. Um, and I, I think we would be doing our students as a whole community by not adopting remote. So please consider these personal concerns, but please, please consider my concerns about students. Um, I'm extremely proud to work for this community and I want to continue having that pride. Thank you. Thanks, Phoebe. Lynette Howard, you're up. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, I really wasn't expecting, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but um, I decided to midstream. And I just want to share, I'm a special education teacher at Frontier and um, BCBA for the district. And I assisted in um, developing a program for students in our district with severe um, disabilities on the middle and high school level about five and a half years ago. And earlier this week, um, I attended an FRTA meeting and I heard several um, sincere, vulnerable reports from my colleagues, which led me to uh, write a letter about the success of the program that we've had this summer remotely with, with our students in the ALPS program. As Phoebe described, Phoebe is one of our, the IAs in our program. Um, I believe that you received that letter on Tuesday this week. Um, so I, I really kind of already described that ESY program in detail um, and all that it included. Um, so I, I won't do that again here. Um, but two weeks ago, I was actively involved in helping to set up a 14 by uh, 20 foot canopy, a customized canopy outside with the hope of 
um, having our students and some of our staff come in next week, which is the final week of our extended school year program, um, for just an hour and a half at a time, just a couple kids at a time, an hour and a half at a time. And as I've spoken with, um, as I've spoken with our instructional assistants, right now there are only two out of six of our instructional assistants that are available to come in next week um, to assist with this uh, 90 minute instruction for two students at a time. And some of the concerns um, that were brought up to me were just voiced again, just voiced by Phoebe. Um, as far as toileting assistance, one of our boys really does need the hand over hand and physical guidance um, just for safety. Several of our kids use Chewies and one of our boys uses a Binky, which he's been using consistently at home um, with a lot of saliva. And um, yeah, we have a lot of face picking and nose picking. And uh, our, our IAs, people are feeling at, you know, really at high risk right now. Um, back in the spring, I took one of our higher functioning boys for a walk up Sugarloaf Mountain because his mom had shared that he was really not successful with, um, hadn't been successful with wearing a mask and he needed to practice. Um, he's one of only two students right now who uh, the parents are reporting are successfully wearing a mask um, at home and in their community. So we have four of our six current students and one who's incoming as a new student that I really don't know a lot about but four of the six are not able to consistently even wear a mask right now, um, which is a concern. But when I took this student up Sugarloaf, he did not understand the concept, and he's one of our higher functioning boys, but he did not understand the concept of social distancing. He was very confused. This is a boy that typically would walk down the hall and we'd be arm in arm, or he wants to hold your hand. You know, our kids like a lot of that physical um, touch and connection. And it was really difficult to um, consistently tell him that we could not, like we had to be distant. Remember for safety, we have to be distant. He did not, he didn't get it. I mean, maybe he got it a little bit, but um, yeah. So I just wanted to share, I feel like um, as a colleague, it's really my responsibility to speak up and say, these are the concerns also in our special education population and I feel at this time we are able to build on a successful remote program if we need to do that for the safety of everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lynette. Heather Momini, you're up. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just a uh, Chiming in uh, regarding um, having the hybrid model. Um, I have two um, uh, children, one's in elementary school, one is going to becoming uh, an eighth grader at Frontier. And I just want to um, really advocate for choice. Um, we are gonna be choosing, we, if we have the choice, we'll be choosing for a hybrid um, model for um, my children. Um, I really do um, believe that uh, this would really allow um, people to have choice. Um, I am also a um, social worker um, for DCF and um, my job right now is extreme. Um, the isolation for these kids in Deerfield, in our area, I am not talking about a different county has been extreme. They are not able to come out and, and speak to safe people. And as I heard in the other uh, meeting uh, for the Union um, 38, right now we, we have very low COVID. And I do wonder if the benchmark right now is low, what would get us back? How would we go to that next step to either phase back into a hybrid or not? If right now, and I understand that UMass is coming back, but right now in Deerfield, in our union, 
the the COVID levels are at the lowest they're going to be. And I think that we should try and do a start. Understanding, and again, more about choice, more about getting these kids seen um, in the community. Um, and again, I, I, I really do um, think that this is more about choice for some of our um, children and parents that can't even get on to these meetings because they don't have the ability to um, stream, to have Wi-Fi. So I'm speaking for the people who are underprivileged and really, they need a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Marianne, you're up. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. I'm not turning on the camera because I had not planned to speak tonight. Um, I did send in a letter uh, advocating, as I said, for full remote, which I stand by. And I did indicate in that letter that I had an, an original survey was like, oh, yeah, hybrid sounds great. But numbers have upticked and that has me concerned. But that was in my letter, which is which you already have. I actually wanted to address uh, something that Carrie had said. Um, and Carrie, you know, no disrespect. I just wanted to double check. I believe you had said you wanted hybrid because you wanted to make sure that your kids with your special needs kids would be able to go to school. But if I'm not mistaken, I thought part of the remote aspect was that there would be fewer people in the building so that the higher priority kids like your kids would, and one of my, one of my kids, although not in this school would actually have the better opportunity and it would be safer because of, um, because there would be fewer kids, but your kids would still be able to, our kids would still be able to go. If I'm mistaken, apologies. I did want to address that. And the other thing was, I was a little concerned. I mean, we're hearing about how allegedly we're getting some information that the rates are low, which a lot of people are pointing out. And again, I, I understand that, but I am concerned about the fact that it is an uptick and that we're making a plan that, um, you know, and we're planning that, you know, oh, if somebody gets sick or there's a problem, we'll just close down. But the issue, but I heard an analysis, an analogy once saying that, co you know, COVID cases are kind of like mice. If you see one, it means there's a dozen that you don't know about. And last of all, I've heard a few concerns. I've heard a couple of comments about if we go to hybrid, it allows more choice. Um, and it, admittedly, it does allow more choice for families and promote. But my concern is that it doesn't allow as much. It doesn't allow any choice for teachers or staff. And we need our teachers and staff healthy. We need to focus on keeping our teachers and health staff healthy as well because that we can't do this without them. And I do appreciate the opportunity to speak. I know that it, this has been incredibly difficult and I don't envy you guys having to come up with a plan or make any decisions. And I know we're all coming at it with the best intentions, but uh, so hopefully... I do urge you to vote remote, and I hopefully addressed that other issue. And like I said, I hadn't planned to speak, so apologies for rambling. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Jenny Yell, you're up. All right. Can you see me now? I can hear you. Okay. Oh, do you want to see me too? No, you don't need to see me. Hi. <laughs> I'm Madame Yell. I've been at Frontier for 29 years plus, and I love it there too. So I'm not going to reiterate what everyone said because I agree and I understand everyone has their own position. What I do want to clarify, though, because this is very important to me, I will come back if I need to. I'm fine with that. But the people who think they have choice, I think they need to realize that choice may not be what you think. If you choose, um, if you choose to stay home, you will not have Frontier teachers. You will not have our curriculum. You will not have our expertise. You will be, you will be taught by I don't know who teaching you from I don't know where to uh, I don't know what. So I just think you need to be clear about that. But anyway, I understand everybody's coming from different points, and I will do whatever I'm told because I work at Frontier. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Nelson, you're up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Liz. I am an instructional assistant at Frontier Regional in the Special Education Alps program. Within this program, we work very closely as a team. And generally, each one of us is assigned a particular student with whom we establish a special rapport. We are with this student throughout the day, 
Um, although everyone works with everyone, every student in the classroom, um, this particular student is uh, one that we are with throughout many aspects of the day. Um, my student that I, t that I usually work with and have continued to work with through the remote summer um, is a bright and funny and caring preteen boy who is a favorite among the students and staff alike at Frontier. His disability is a genetic disorder that's characterized by extreme heightened anxiety and lowered impulse control. He relies on physical interventions such as deep pressure stimulation, squeezes, hugs, and breathing techniques. I cannot go an hour, let alone a day, without having physical contact with the student. When we get back to school with full PPE, social distancing, little to no friend interaction, and a completely new normal, he is going to need support more than ever, and I am at a loss to understand how to provide it. So because of this, I strongly encourage the vote for a full remote start. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Bob, that wraps it up for public comment. Is there anybody else out there before we switch over to the committee members? Okay, um, Darius, you wanna say anything before the committee members chime in? I think um, I just wanna start by thanking, um, you know, I just wanna thank everyone for their, their thoughts tonight, but I also just wanna do uh, give us a little pause and talked about Mr. Linnaeus and Mr. Dredge last night putting together the senior senior class night was went off with a success. I think we just need a little break from all that kind of heavy talk for a second and they just did a, they did a wonderful job of trying to do a kind of the senior class farewell. Um, and they had to do it you know virtually but uh, I was, was told and we got lots of feedback it was, it was it was a great success. So I just want to say thank you to both of you for all your work and everybody behind the scenes. Scott, who should I thank behind the scenes? Or uh, George, who should I thank behind the scenes? Kevin, we really need to thank Kevin, Kevin yeah. Murphy. Kevin Murphy. Yeah, he did a he nailed job. It. Yeah. Yeah. And then everybody else should just kind of stretch a little bit. It's been almost two hours here. You know, everybody get a little stretch and then you guys can take off. <laughs> I'm ready for questions and whatnot um, on that um, overall. Um, committee members, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand, or if you're not on the screen, then chime in. But if you're on the screen, just just raise your hand, and, and I'll just pick you, and you can talk if you like. Who wants to go first? Lynn? You can go first, Lynn. Sorry, Phil. All right. Um, well, honestly... Everything that I was going to say has been um, supported by the teachers. I received, like you did, lots and lots of emails, and the overwhelming majority of them went to supporting a remote um, learning for for all the reasons that the teachers gave here. And I guess this is what this is where I'm coming from. I'm a teacher. I'm a parent of a frontier kid. Um, I'm a school committee member, and I'm really trying hard to try to wear all the hats and not be overly emotional about this. But as my daughter texted me earlier today when she was getting taking her break from scooping ice cream, it's just not worth the risk. It's just not. My daughter, she's uh, a rising senior. She wrote, how many students, teachers, faculty members, parents, siblings, grandparents, or other family members have to get sick before the schools close again? How many have to be put on respirators? How many have to die before we realize the inevitable truth that opening schools, even with the hybrid model, is both irresponsible and dangerous? That's what she wanted me to tell you. She also wanted me to tell you this, and this is the sticky note that she left before she went to work today. It says, my daughter is not your lab rat. I know there were people who mentioned in other meetings that it was worth the risk. They were curious to know. It was an opportunity to find out how schools could open or if they could open. It was that curiosity factor. There was another person who said that schools can be shut down 
if there are pop-ups. How many people on ventilators equals a pop-up? And how is my daughter or anybody else's daughter or son or whomever, how does anybody worth it, should be exposed to that risk? It just blows my mind that people will want to risk other people's lives for their curiosity. I can't do that. I won't do that. Not today, not tomorrow, and not next Tuesday. I'm not putting somebody else's life on my conscience. And that's where I am. Thanks, Lynn. Phil? Uh, yeah. So, so um, you know, before, you know, without really getting into sort of how I feel yet, I just, th there was a significant amount of questions that were asked, um, especially from our teachers. And I just would, was wondering if we could, get to sort of answering some of them is I was a little bit concerned about some of the uh, some of the factual statements or sort of the the, the 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 that within some of those questions because some of the things about testing um, ab about local rates of transmission etc were certainly different than what my understanding is the situation that the plans call for so if that could be addressed um, before we just start you know, giving her before I, I don't know. So that's my, my that's my question. Sure. <clears throat> so I, I, I um, Bob, just a point of order, folks, you can't be, you can't, you really shouldn't be, you actually shouldn't be texting in comments as to when people are speaking. It, it really, not only is it distracting, but it's, and it's in a way it's, it's, it's bullying people's opinions. You had your chance to speak. Um, please respect that. And Bob asked you to do that in the beginning. Please respect that because it's just really, you know, we're not having people cheered on. Um, so regards to, you know, data things. So right now, you know, the school committee, I, I sent out a, uh, a form that, that, over, that shows the data overall regards to what would take to close, to close the school down. Um, that data has gone to the Board of Health. We're also waiting for the state to come out with its numbers as well to help aid in that area. So you know, basically, you know, the data points, um, I think that's what you were talking about, Bill, um, you know, are open for discussion. You know, I don't have the states to compare it to yet because the state hasn't put it out yet. Um, they, they, according to the commissioner, I was on a meeting with him today. I thought they were going to be released today. Um, now they're talking about early next week. Um, but, you know, he said he's the team, the, the doctors that are working with Jesse are helping to put those parameters together. But at the same time, the draft I gave to all of you, I gave to Carolyn Ness, who's taken to the regional boards of health to get their opinion so that we kind of aren't just acting isolary, that we're talking about um, all the people kind of together looking at those numbers and stuff. Um, I think there's a lot of, the teachers pointed out a lot of issues, um, you know, with the plan. And remember how this, this would be brought forward, you know, and I am, you know, defending the hybrid plan because I believe it has, um, it has the ability for us to try to get students back in person if it's possible. If it's not possible, we get numbers that go up or, or we can't do that um, thing. I, I, I understand that, but um, we built the plan for the each building team to come back to, to fill in the details, how students walk in the building, all those kind of things. We needed teachers to be a part of that decision-making, not only to make it work, um, because, but we need their expertise, not just to make work, but to make them comfortable with it. And so that, you know, some of those things were, you know, specifically left off. So, you know, there is a lot of holes in the plan that we know about, but we really need it to be built from the building and how we do it. And that's why also we talked about a slow rollout. You know, you're talking about 10 days of professional development. Then you're talking about orientation days. And then you're talking about half days. And then, you know, and we even talked about being and reducing those half days, the less students in the building, everything's on the table. But the idea was that we're trying to get students back in person. And so, and so that's the idea behind the plan. You know, and I, if you agree with it or disagree with it, that's fine. But I just want to be clear that that was the, the purpose of putting that plan together in that fashion. And when someone says, you know, what are you voting on tonight? I will be, I'll be clear. The plan that's in front of you will, will be modified. You know, I do need that. I need the teacher's input on it I need, and staff input on it. And, um, you know, and I, you know, obviously we also have an association's input on it. And so things will be adjusted, but the idea is to bring students back. So it's really, when you talk about the essence of, um, you know, the hybrid versus the remote, 
there's a lot of things to work out on each on each of them. Um, but that's kind of the, the thought there. So I don't want to go too far down that road, but those are, um, though I, I don't know if I answered your question, please be, you know, pick away at me if I didn't. Thanks, Darius. Bill, you want to you finish? Well, this, if you could just address specifically the testing, because when I when I heard, I, I believe it was, I heard, I heard more than one teacher talk about the length of time um, about tests coming back. And, it, and if you could address the, the, the testing and the, the, the length of time that's envisioned and, and how that's going to work, because that's the one thing that I wouldn't want misinformation about. I, I can chime in a little bit because I know I've heard through the great, well, I'm not going to say through the grapevine. If you go to a Bay State location or a Mercy location, what I'm telling is 24 to 48 hours. If you go to CVS, Rite Aid, whatever those places, it's going out of state and it's going to take nine to 12 days. Missy, you could probably chime in. You maybe know a little bit yeah. more, but that's, but that's what I've been told. Tell me if I'm wrong or right or possible. So, so in part, uh, you're right. And I will, I will tell you that this is a moving piece, right? This isn't static that Cooley is going to take 24 to 48 hours. Bay State's going to take 24 to 48 hours and anywhere else is going to take if they go out of state, it's going to take longer. As a general rule, that is true. That being said, I told you that last week and this weekend, I worked in urgent care and tests that had been coming back in 24 hours were taking two to three days. There's two pieces behind that. One is that there was a, a drop in supply of reagent causing a testing delay. And then the other piece is that there was a, a computer issue where there may have been test results back, but not able to be transferred to somebody to review those results. So you know, part of what I've been in communication with Darius uh, this week and part of, of what I asked about this kind of protocol for reopening is how quickly are we able to get that part of the information that you know, part of the protocol for reopening is that if testing is, I think exactly how it's wording is that testing in all sites in Franklin and Hampshire County are uh, greater than 72 hours. I'm, I'm curious whether we have constant communication with all testing sites in Franklin and Hampshire County to get that up-to-date information on a regular basis because last week I thought tests were coming back 24 hours. This weekend they were taking three days. So no, I don't have the, I don't I don't have that ability. I have to work with the board of health because I don't actually see any of the test results. Those aren't sent to me. I work with the local board of health, and then they tell me what Navin's kind of coming up with. And so I don't know how the communication of that testing timing is done. I know it's being looked at, um, and that's why we added it as part of our plan um, because it was one of those numbers that were important. Um, because you you know right because if, if your testing timing is not is off, that could throw off your results. So um, I, mean, I can try to get greater. Again, it's a draft of that portion of it, the protocol for, you know, um, thing, but I think it does show an outline of trying to be very conscious of what are our rates in our community, are they rising, and that we have to have those kind of preset rather than, as I said before, like calling a snow day, calling a few people and get a few people's opinions on what they think is going to happen. We really have to have really strong parameters ahead of time to what those are. If we need to, again, I don't have the states to run that off of and i don't know how that um that particular the 72 hours gets you know uh finite and if meg is on if she, meg if you're on and you know the answer jump on um, if you don't you don't have to come on and say you don't know the answer um but you know you know, you know meg and i were working together on trying to putting that together so um yeah i'd, I'd just be curious about how that communication works is that a daily report or a weekly report how, how frequently are we getting that information Phil, did you, was that a question, Missy, that you're asking somebody about that? Darius, this is, Bob, sorry, sorry, Bob, but this is Meg Birch. My, Meg, how you doing? My screen was frozen. Um, so to answer the question, Missy, um, I have been working with public health nurses and with folks at the FERCOG um, to, you know, on, on that very question um and the reason it's i'm working with the FERCOG is because they are coordinating with some of the air you know uh bay state franklin and the community health center and there is a meeting next week um which includes um 
both Cooley and Franklin and the Health Center and Valley Medical to talk about this very issue. Um, and um, the, the questions being posed were questions gathered from public health nurses across Franklin County um, to really address this um, as, as a key factor for schools um, to safely move forward with their plans. So that's as much as I can answer tonight. That's okay, that's fine. I think it kind of goes to highlight that there's a lot of things that we're voting on that we're not sure exactly what the details are gonna be, which kind of increases some of the uncertainty. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Missy. Phil, did you want to finish with any other question before I went go to somebody else? If not, I think Damien is next. Yeah. If I, if I forgot somebody, chime back in. I, I'm not listening to the chat area. There you go, Phil. Go ahead. No, I, um, yeah, um, this is a really difficult decision. So, um, and I'm not even ready to talk yet about it, actually. It's, okay. been, it's been pretty tough. Thanks. Damien? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say this, uh, this is probably the most uh, difficult decision I've ever had to make on school committee. I have moved to Deerfield 12 years ago. And I've been on now school committee for five years, and this is by far the most challenging uh, thing to talk about, to to vote on, to make a decision. Uh, that said, where I where I'm gonna I guess start is just thanking everyone. I I thank the teachers for all of their input tonight. I sat through most of today reading uh, email after email, trying to get caught up on all of them. Uh, some some of the teachers are friends of mine. Some of the teachers are uh, have taught my kids, and I respect them greatly for everything that they've worked with my kids for. And this is just a very uh, challenging uh, decision to make. Uh, that said, uh, Phil, I'm glad this is kind of a good segue. Phil, I'm glad you brought it up. And Darius, you commented on the uh, the protocol for potential school closure. Um, it. I think gives us a good outline. It is a draft, but it also gives uh, a very good um, set data points for how schools can open and close and maybe then reopen and then close again. Um, but it, uh, it gives an outline for that. Can some of the numbers change? I think it's still on draft form. Uh, some of the websites that we're using, I, um, I don't know if they're, all getting their data from the same point. I've looked at some some uh, websites today. Um, the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, which is, I think, where the draft uh, is getting a lot of its information from. Another website, uh, the Harvard Global Health Institute, um, and it, you can uh, put in each county of each state, and it shows the infection rate of where we're at right now. And everything that I've looked at it's we still have a very low caseload and what i keep coming back to with the decision that we're making is if we don't attempt to open right now when will we we have to start somewhere and i know this is difficult and everyone's got different reasons for doing it um but as as a society as a community we have to attempt to teach our children in the most beneficial way. And I know I hear from the teachers saying that they will put robust virtual plans together. And I don't doubt that it won't be better than it was in the spring. And, and I hope that it is. Um, but in every article that I have read from the, uh, who's this one I pulled up? From the American Academy of Pediatrics to the CDC, to uh, you know, website after website and article after article, virtual learning is no replacement for in-house learning. And will it be challenging? Will it be difficult? Will it be different? Absolutely. There's no question about it. There will be kids in masks. They'll be separating. 
but we have to attempt and try to do something to help the disadvantaged kids, to help kids that just need something, need structure in their life. My kids, I'll admit, I have a, a incoming eighth grader and also one in uh, elementary school in sixth grade. I know my wife and I, if the hybrid model is chosen, we will choose it. They did okay with the virtual learning this spring. I don't have the horror stories that I've that I've heard tonight about it, but they need something. They need to be with with their peers. They need to have the structure. They need, even if it's just for two weeks in the beginning of the school year, just to meet their teachers, just to make that connection. You're not going to make the connection online in front of a screen and sitting there for six hours in front of a computer screen learning. It's, it's very, very difficult for a child. And we have to adapt to the new ways of, of what this is, because this is not going to go away. We can all hope there's going to be a, uh, a, uh, a vaccine in the next couple months, but I'm not counting on it. It may be years. So what are we going to do? Teach our kids for years virtually? I, I, I can't accept that. And we have to go back into the classrooms and attempt to make this work. And if it doesn't, then we close and we start over and we come up with those robust virtual plans that we're all talking about. But we have to, while the cases are low, we have to attempt to do it. And I, I, I know no matter what decision we make, we're going to have, you know, I, I'm not going to make everyone happy, but... I'm coming from a parent right now. I'm coming from, you know, community members that I've talked to. And I, I know that it, it, no matter what decision is made, it's tough. But I know tonight I'm choosing a hybrid model. So thank you. Thanks, Damien. Missy? All right. I'm not limited to three minutes, right? No. Nope. All right, good. I've been working on this. All right. Um, so first of all, I just, I, I, I know that a lot of you have been on the school committee for longer than I have, and I know that this is the hardest decision that you've had to make. Also, hardest decision I've had to make in the few months that I've been on the school committee. Um, now, that being said, I do bring a little bit of a unique perspective to this. I have been trying to mull this over from a lot of different positions. And one of the positions I come from is that I'm a healthcare provider. I'm a PA, I work in sleep medicine, and I work in urgent care at Cooley Dickinson. And every time I feel like I have thought of all the possible implications, I end up finding one more. I've changed my mind on where I thought uh, I stand on these issues several times over the last few weeks. And I'm hoping that what I have to share about my evolution and thinking in this decision will at least, at the very least, give you some pause before making your decision tonight. I have felt torn as I've digested the heartfelt and passionate letters, many, many letters that have uh, really challenged my multitasking over the last several weeks and particularly the last two weeks. Um, and I, I'm touched by how much everyone cares about the best thing happening, both for everybody in the school staff and for our students. And it's hard because there's no decision that makes this good for everybody. None of these decisions is good for everybody. We're either sacrificing a health risk or we're sacrificing some in-person education. There is something that's gonna have to give no matter which decision we make. And we're gonna have to decide which sacrifice we're okay with making. I initially thought that hybrid was the way to go. I think it's tempting to see this option as a challenge. I think it's tempting to say, we can do this, we can put protocols into place, we can keep everybody safe, we can change schedules, we can wear masks, 
We can decrease volumes of students in the building. It's tempting to think that this gets us everything. In person and remote, you have a choice. You can do whatever you want. But this doesn't give teachers that same option. And there's one other piece of this that came to light last night. After the vote on Tuesday, there was a comment that I read last night where a community member said, now that the schools are opening up, when do we get to, when, when's the library going to open up? When can this, the senior center open up? This decision is not just about we as a school community. This, this decision to bring kids back into the school in this volume puts our community at risk. It signals to the community that it's okay to gather in large groups. It's okay to take mass breaks inside at a time when the governor is discussing monitoring numbers and rolling back phases at a time where we are seeing an increase in numbers. I'll go into that in just a little bit because I can give you a little perspective on what you're seeing. In that time when it is all that much more important for us to be safe we're talking about bringing back half of the student population and signaling to the community that they may be safe to take riskier actions themselves. I'm concerned that we're moving to get people in the building at a much faster pace than any other industry in the state, the medical community included. I see the value in in-person learning, and I know that that is real right along with the social emotional piece for our students. I worry that we are rushing with this hybrid plan as it stands. I would suggest that we flip our thinking and our messaging on this decision instead of either encouraging everybody to stay home or everybody to come in with the option to move out. I would encourage us to tell everyone who can possibly manage it to stay home, that we work on building a robust model and that anyone who needs special, our special needs population, our IEP, families who have students who really struggle with remote learning, let's bring them in in a much smaller capacity so that we can really focus on making the remote learning what it should be and letting a smaller population assume a much lower risk for being indoors or ideally outdoors where you can see studies. There's a, a study in China where it looks like the risk outdoors is about 19%, 19 times lower than what it is indoor. We can see this in our own community. The recent outbreak at Bay State where you had people sharing a break room, eating in the same place with masks not on, right? 46 people, the last count I heard, and I'm sure that number will grow. We're talking about that as an option, you know, breaks outside when possible, when the weather doesn't permit, we're heading into fall and eventually winter. I, I don't know how many of us can guarantee that there won't be inclement rain, or wind that will permit us to be outside whenever kids are eating, when they're taking these mass breaks. I would either suggest a remote start to the school year or a much, much, much slower hybrid model where we are focusing on bringing in our most at-risk students and phasing in more students as we can, as it's safe. I have concerns about the protocol that we have in place for shutting down. What, what it says is that there's gonna be a short-term closure for one to three days while the safety of ongoing face-to-face -face instruction is assessed. So we just talked about, we're not sure how we're getting information about the testing delay. So if that's three days and we don't hear about it until next week, that's too late. If we have, and that is if, if I've, I've got it up here, if I think that that is if one person is in the building with confirmed COVID and there are close contacts in the school building. We close for one to three days and reassess. 
if it's two, three to five days for us to reassess. People can be contagious with this two days before they have symptoms up to 10 days after they stop having symptoms. And in that protocol, I don't see anything that mandates that somebody who is in close contact has a mandated 14 day quarantine as many of the hospital systems are implementing, implementing for their own employees or that they have to have a negative test. And I just wanna be clear, and this will speak a bit to Phil's point, the speed at which we get information matters. If you look at the COVID dashboard, if you don't know what you're looking at, these numbers can be very misleading. There's some graphs at the very top of the COVID dashboard. And if you look at them, you will see that there's a 90 to 93% decrease in the seven day weighted average for positive results. That's been pretty consistent for months. That's measuring us against April 5th. We've come a long way since April 5th. That doesn't tell us anything about what happened last week. If you look at what happened last week, on July 27th, right, one of the things that happens with this dashboard is they report cases and they filter them to the date that you were tested. They changed that back in May. It used to be that all the positive test results came back and they filtered in on the day that they came back. Now those test results go to the day that they came in. So I'm gonna give you some examples over this past week. On July 27th, there were 182 positive test results that came back that day. Three of them were people that had their test results that day. So the positive tests on July 27th was three. Three people got tested and got their results back on that same day. The next day, we had 178 positive test results. 46 of them were from the 27th. Not true. The number for the 27th went up to 46. So 43 of them. As of yesterday, the number for July 27th is 358. And it actually, I checked it before I left because they updated at four o'clock. It went up by one today. That's 10 days ago. So we're talking about making decisions for a three day closure for test results that may come back 10 days later. That's a big jump from the 27th, even on the 29th, they were well below, well below 300. If you look at the tests that are now positive on the 30th, knowing what you now know that there may be an ongoing delay, it was the first day since June 3rd, where we have been over 400 positive test results. This Missy, can I ask a question? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Does it, does it tell you how many people were tested for those 400 people? Because um, that's it. what that's the percentage. It, it, it's, a, it's a little harder to, to clearly tell that piece um, because it tells you on each day how many people were tested. And so it tells you how many day uh, on each day, how many people were tested. And then it tells you how many people were positive. You can go through and actually, I, I can't tell you how many people were tested on that day. On the 27th, uh, 15,976 people were tested. We have had an increase and that increase went up today to 2.1% actually went down. It was at 2.2% three days ago, it's down to 2.1%. 3% is our, our cutoff for closure. And what was and what was it back in, we'll say May, was it yeah. still up to like 2% or higher? Yeah, so it gets, I mean, there's a lot of things that have changed since May, right? The, the number yeah. of testing that we've done is far different since then. So it, it's hard to compare May's numbers on all those statistics to, to now, which is- But the percentage- but the but the percentages have come down, correct? For the percentage of positive test results have come down, but the numbers 
are showing a clear trend in the last week, along with a delay in testing. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I just want to, I know that in-person learning means something and, and it means something to all of us so very clearly, but remote learning has value too. And remote learning does done well can give not only, I mean, the reality is if we keep up at this pace nationwide, these may be really important skills for these kids to have at their colleges may all be online. So uh, given that, given that we don't know how long this is going to last, given that everyone, I haven't heard anybody say that we're not going to remote at some point in time. Why not give ourselves the time to get prepared to do this right, to get in-person learning to those who really need it and do really well and let our teachers know that we support them in making that happen and then keeping them safe and in keeping the kids safe, let's set them up for success. It doesn't have to be like March. We can see this coming. I got my master's degree. The reason why I can see patients is because I did an online program. Most of my learning was distance. I had some in-person labs, but I did online learning. This can work. I bet one, if not more than one of you, has taken an online course. Many of our teachers are furthering their education through online methods. This doesn't have to be messy. If you get thrown into it, it is. I, you can't not prepare. I, I talked with a teacher in one of the committee meetings, and I suggested that maybe they get some some worksheets out to the students three weeks ahead of time because of the recommendations of how long it has to sit and wait. And she said, I can't do that. I prepare my lessons a week ahead of time. So we're giving these people <laughs> a weekend to prepare for switching the, their classes from in-person to online. It's no wonder that everybody struggled in that in that model let's give them the time to prepare to do well especially if this is where we can all see them headed and i will also tell you not only did i get my education through a distance model i also met my wife online so you can develop some really good relationships through distance my kids have met their grandparents and developed really good relationships with their grandparents and their cousins through FaceTime, through Skype. We can do this. We just have to be prepared for it. And there's no need to put anybody at any extra risk by moving too fast. We can do this slowly in a measured pace and make sure everybody succeeds. That's it. Thanks, Missy. You're welcome. Is that, is that it? That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the information. Thank you. No problem. I'm happy Olivia, to I think you're about any of it. Hey, Bob, can I just do one real quick thing? Just because you, you uh, Misty referenced that we didn't have uh, documents on what we do if a student has a, a case. And there was a lot of work done by a lot of people. So I just want to make sure from those committees. Um, so I just want to post, I'll post it into the um, into the chat there. Just, we, did, we do have documents about, about what we do if a student, if a student or a classmate I, has that. Can I clarify that? I, I don't, I don't mean that there wasn't any guidance on it, but in that guidance, I don't see anything that says that they have to quarantine for a certain time period or come back with a negative test. Am I wrong? It's in there. It's a, it's a, I just wanted to make sure because I know a lot of people who are on those committees are in that. And I'm not sure that's going to make a difference of someone going one way. We're going to have to have, we're going to need to have them. I just was just wanted to point out that we, we create them just, just because hours and hours went into it. Thank you. Olivia. Um, thank you. I am so impressed with all of Missy's knowledge and really appreciate um, all of those numbers. I don't have those skills. I could do an interpretive dance about numbers going up and down, but um, I, I will not. Um, I, I did write out a few bullet points because um, I'm an emotional person and I just will drone on and on 
like I'm doing. Um, I definitely want to thank, for sure, first of all, the eight committees of staff and admin and teachers who spent countless hours creating the plans that address the needs of our students and our families and of the teachers. And thank you to everyone. I know it doesn't seem sincere, but it really is, who shared their opinions with me via phone and email and text. I really did read every single one. And at the beginning, I was getting back to everybody with a note of thanks, but fast and furious and I just couldn't. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, a, a lot of really great information came from those. One of the things that really stood out to me um, was sent by Chrissy Huntley, who is a preschool teacher in Waitley. Um, and she had some really great um, suggestions and you know, conflicting views about what made her feel comfortable about sending her kids to school um, that we could maybe use in making our, our families feel more comfortable about that and addressing some of those those points. So um, school committee members, if you got that letter, I urge you to look at that. Um, and if you haven't, then I'm happy to send that along to you. Um, John Dean also made some really great points because, and then um, Mr. Modesto addressed some of those, you know, there's so many things we don't know. We don't know how many teachers have the medical conditions that are going to prevent them from working in person. We don't know how many teachers will opt to retire early when faced with that option. We don't know how many parents are going to elect remote, even if a hybrid is offered. So there are a lot of things on the table um, and a lot of really great things came out of that. So thank you. Um, in addition to the opinions of all those awesome people, um, I spent tons of time reading medical journals, um, following citations, and speaking with infectious disease doctors and other medical professionals, and bothering Trevor and Carolyn, um, our select people, about my concerns, because we will have 800 new students and families pouring into Deerfield into their three private schools. Um, and those students are going to leave their bubble and come to our bubble, and vice versa. Um, every single person I have come in contact with over the last month or so I have tried to subtly say, so what are you thinking about the start of school? Um, and I'm aware of my own confirmation bias and I really try to consider other perspectives. Um, but if I'm charged with voting as a Deerfield representative to the school committee and representing the Deerfield families that contacted me, um, all of those families were overwhelming, well not all of them, they were overwhelmingly for the hybrid option. Um, but I'm also a parent of three. I have two frontier students. Um, and I also have, uh, my oldest is a teacher in New Bedford. Um, she's a middle school teacher and it's a huge deal to me personally as well. Um, for privacy, I, I won't go into how badly remote learning for us, uh, was emotionally and academically, um, this March, but I do know that we, we absolutely can and have to do better. Um, I don't believe teachers should shoulder the burden of keeping our country going or that students should be treated as guinea pigs. I do think that by the time flu season rolls around, that will have to be fully remote. Um, it's impossible for parents and teachers to tell the difference between flu sy symptoms and kids are gonna be in and out of the nurse's office and that special room um, all the time. Uh, Mr. Cheryl mentioned that going from hybrid to remote could be jarring. And I absolutely agree that we need to keep the focus um, not on recreating the spring, but making it a fluid transition from remote to hybrid and back. Um, the hybrid is hybrid, but it is mostly remote. Three of the days um, are remote. So planning for remote should absolutely be something that is really important, regardless of which model um, we choose. Um, but I do personally think it's important for small orientations and classes to happen in person at the onset. If we start fully remote, we're likely to remain fully remote through April. Um, and a lot of families have mentioned that they have, um, and they use the word PTSD, um, from, from what, what happened in the spring. Um, but on the other hand, the health of the entire frontier community is of the utmost importance. Um, we've heard a million times today that the effects are not completely known. And that's not just for teens. We don't know the long-term effects for adults. We don't know the long-term effects for anybody. And this could be detrimental to people for their entire lives. Um, I lost a family to COVID last week, um, but it isn't going anywhere. Like similar viruses, uh, we can have a vaccine and we can lessen the severity, 
but it's never going to go, it's not going to go away. It won't be eradicated and we'll be dealing with it. And our kids will be dealing with it in school for years to come. Um, I'm not personally comfortable with bringing half the school in at a time. I don't think 300 kids and staff in school is maybe the way to go. But I also know that full remote learning um, isn't healthy for the spirit, mind, and body. Um, so I just want to say whatever is decided tonight, I really hope that we can come together as a community to support the teachers and the students and the administration and, and develop a best practice for going forward because it's, it's not going to end anytime soon. I'm done. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. Bob, can Hi, I, Mary. Can I say something what? real quick to Darius? Thank you. That was much more detailed information than I had previously seen. Thank you. Mary. Hello. Hi, Mary. I, I know we've been on here a very long time, um, but I... I you I take your time. By echoing a lot of people. So starting with Olivia to say the thanks to all the people she thanked, uh, I do as well. I want Damien to know that a short time ago, I was exactly where you are. I work at a seven through 12 school. I volunteered to chair the health and wellness committee. I'm not typically a person that operates uh, from fear and anxiety. And I said, we can, we need to make this plan and we can do that. And I also supervise the nurse. So I worked very closely with our school nurse at my school and quickly found we had maybe, let's say five questions to answer. We answered them all and created 25 more questions. And we just kept at it and at it. And it's all about risk management. And we felt like we can, we can do this, we can manage the risks. But more recently, and Missy is so much more eloquent than I am, and so much more uh, factual than I could possibly be, but recently I've come to realize we can manage the risk. It's really difficult to manage human behavior. And I, I see um, you know, kids in cars without masks traveling together because that's what kids do. And I see kids in the center of town in a, a group, not a large group, but in groups without masks and hanging out because that's what kids do. And so I just, so appreciate what the teachers have all said because it looks very different when you're inside of the building and you're in those hallways and you're in that nurse's office um, and realize that on paper there's a there's a great plan that could very well work but it will only work if all the protocols are adhered to 100 percent of the time and you know the story from bay state is they're the medical people and they've done a wonderful job there, but they let somebody let their guard down and it, and it even happens there in increased cases. Nobody sets out to catch COVID. Nobody wants it, but mistakes are made and people can be exposed to someone very innocently, unknowingly. It could even be a family member that you're with all the time. So for those reasons, um, I will vote also to go remote. I do want to be sure though that the special populations um, are considered very separately and allowed and planned so that they can have some in-person time. Um, children, students that without the internet, I think we need to make sure that they are taken care of. Care of. Um, and for now, that's where I stand and I'm hoping that we can be hybrid soon and back in person at some point. And if I'm wrong, I would be delighted to be wrong. You can all tell me so. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, who would like to go next? Can you want to talk tonight? Some of us, I just want to let you know, some of us were on the uh, elementary boards. So some of us spoke the other night. Um, Keith was one of the ones that spoke and he came from, from a couple of different ways. So I don't mind if you repeat what you said or something new since Tuesday. Yeah, I'll comment. Um, uh, so first thing I'd like to... Uh, 
thank everybody who wrote emails and communicated. I try to read as many as I can. Thank everybody for the hard work, uh, school committees and staff that they put in. I'm going to try to stay away from like comparisons and anecdotes because I, I want to try to keep this as objective as possible. And I, I'm going to try not to argue against another side. I'm, I think I just owe it to the communities to uh, uh, why I'm going to take the position I did. So I voted for the hybrid model the other night and I'm not going to change that decision. I think it would be uh, a little bit hypocritical to change. Uh, it's a difficult decision. It's deeply personal. Uh, I'm a teacher in a neighboring district. My spouse works in the district. My kids go to school in this district. I live part-time with a 75-year-old mother with underlying conditions. Um, so this is deeply personal. I'm also an emergency medical responder in Sunderland. I'm an emergency medical responder with the National Park Service, too. So uh, I've worked in close proximity to the virus. Uh, uh, I've, I've had employees test positive and negative. I've seen the stress that comes from that. Um, I've learned to trust my PPE. I've not become complacent about it or over rely on it, but I've learned um, how to use it. Uh, I've been struck by the amount of people I've seen in the general public who are adhering to those guidelines. Um, and right now I look that we do have extraordinarily low numbers in our community. There is a rise statewide, but our, the numbers in our community are extremely low. Uh, I've heard things, well, you know, we're not going to close until somebody gets sick. And that's not necessarily true. That's what not what anybody on this district wants. Uh, some of the numbers that are, if there's a 5% rise in the positivity rate statewide, we'll shut down. That means there's nobody gets sick in our district. There's a possibility we'll shut down. If there's a 3% rise in any of the, the, the towns in the county, and again, that doesn't mean somebody in the school got sick, we will shut down. Uh, we have extraordinarily low um, positivity rates, but then the devil's in the details. So positivity rates for our four towns, and I know there are other towns coming in, Sunderland's at 1.0, Deerfield's at 0.5, Conway's at zero, and yes, Waitley's at 7% right now. That's a positivity rate though, that's 28 people tested and two people tested positive. So that's 7% is two people. So that even the numbers get really difficult when you dig down deep. The reason I'm supporting a hybrid plan right now is um, really two reasons. One is flexibility. One, I think I don't look at the hybrid and virtual as mutually exclusive. I think that the hybrid is setting the stage for the virtual learning we are gonna to have to do. I don't want superintendent or principal or nurse to try to figure out, is this cold, is this flu or is this COVID? And by the time we get to the fall, late fall, we're going to have to go virtual. I would like a hybrid to set the stage for successful, uh, success, successful virtual learning. I look at the phased opening is really important. Teachers will have the time. I don't think that the beginning time is going to be spent just on what are we going to do in class. It's going to be spent on how to do good virtual learning because virtual is a significant part of the hybrid model. Um, there's a slow reopening, as Darius said. There's going to be a period of time for teachers to work. Then there's going to be an extended um, introduction period. And then we're going to slowly bring kids in half days. So it is, it is not a rush to go in. And as Darius said, at any point in time, if there's any changes, we can extend it. It's not. This is a draft. Um, yeah, so we have 10 days orientation and the slow reopening. Um, I've heard some have spoken to me and said that we should start remote and then move to maybe reopening when things get better. That that's a hybrid model. So that, that's another, I mean, it's, it's flipping it. And I, I would rather start with low community transmission when the weather is good. I don't want to try to reopen later in December, January, February. That's when we're going to have to stay closed. Um, the second reason is I think this, this serves the highest percentage of our population. We have a huge, uh, we have a large per percentage that want to go virtual, and then we have a percentage that wants to try to come back. If we go virtual, we don't serve the ones who want to try to come back in some way, shape, or form. So we have a population of students and parents who do want to return in some way as safely as possible, and under this, the hybrid model, they can. We have a population of students and parents who do want to go virtual. They don't feel safe coming in the building. Under this plan, they, they can go virtual. It will serve them. Um, we have teachers who do want to return and this can, they, they may return. We also have teachers who do not want to return and they can opt out and they'll be the ones to do the virtual teaching. Um, but you know, anybody who doesn't want to come back in the building, they can make no mistake. There will be risk coming back in the building. There is risk. Um, and then the elephant in the room is there's a lot of flexibility in this and there's going to have to be flexibility in the part of the teachers and the, in, in the administration. And Darius had talked about the, uh, the amount of, flexibility we have to have. And I've heard good faith of everyone working together. But ultimately, if 80% if, if of the students want to come back and only 20% of the teachers want to come back, then, then the model doesn't work and we have to go virtual. But we, next week, we, we could vote for hybrid tonight. And next week, we're doing virtual anyway. Uh, if there's 
more changes and the governor comes out with significant changes, we could be virtual anyway. I just look at the, the hybrid right now as safely as we possibly can, gives the most opportunity to serve the most people in this district. People can make the choices that they want. Nobody will be coming to anybody's door and forcing them into the building. Again, this is a draft and there's still work to be done on it. I think everybody's willing to work together. It's a really difficult choice, but for those reasons, the flexibility um, and that it serves the most is the reason why I'm gonna support the hybrid. Thanks, Keith. Who would like to be next? Bill, you wanna come back on? Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so um, I'm the Conway representative to Frontier. I'm also the Conway Grammar School Committee and I'm a selectman in Conway. And um, the one thing I'm not on is the Conway Board of Health, but I do talk to them almost every day and I'm on the weekly conference calls, et cetera. Um, as many of you may know, many of you may not know, the Deerfield, the Frontier School is in, under the jurisdiction of the Deerfield Board of Health. In Deerfield, that's composed of the Select Board the select board is also the board of health. The select board in Deerfield currently um, is in, composed entirely of current or former school committee members. Um, and you know, the, the, in, in, in speaking with them regularly and in speaking with my own, uh, with, with, with Conway's board of health on an almost daily basis, that I am informed that there right now among all four of our towns is no community spread. Um, that, 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 um, and that there are no positive tests or with the, there, there are no active cases, um, amongst school, amongst the school community in any of the four towns. And I don't know if that fact has been put out there today or not, but, um, uh, you know, to the extent that that makes anybody feel just a little bit better, uh, uh whatever the, but I, I will say that the letters that people sent are, were, were incredible. They were very thoughtful. Um, I, I, I read them all. Um, I was also part of the Tuesday night decision that, that voted for, uh, for, as far as the Conway uh, School Committee went, we, that voted unanimously to do the hybrid um, option. And, you know, I, I, when you sit and you listen and you sort of agree with everything that everybody says, um, what, what I fall back on is just, you know, when I have no, no trust, no faith in the federal government, very little trust or faith in the state government. Um, but I do trust our local government and I do trust our superintendent and I do trust this school administration. Um, I've been on school committee for 10 years now. And, um, you know, this is my fourth superintendent. And, um, the, I, I, I sincerely believe that we have the right person in the job at the right time, um, you know, in, in the right place. And, um, it, you know, and I, I've known Meg Birch for 20 years. I, I sincerely and I sincerely believe that, that, that she has everybody's best interests in, in, you know, in mind. And, um, uh, you know, I, so, so, you know, when, when it's the position of the administration that they want to try, that they want the flexibility of the, the, uh, the, the hybrid option. And even though, you know, I, um, I'm nobody's rubber stamp, but in this instance, uh, I, I do trust them and, um, and, and that's how I'm going to vote. So that's. Thanks, Phil. We haven't heard from Judy, Bob, Bill, Bob, hello. Yo, go ahead, Bill. I um, I want to chime in here. I've been sitting and listening. Tell them how many years you've been on the board. Do I have to? Please. <laughs> 404, 44. <coughs> 44. <coughs> okay. Chokes me up when I say that, but it's 44. But okay. You know, this is um. This is an excruciating decision for all of us to have to go through. And there are, are just, for my personal opinion, there are too many factors involved in this thing that I can't control. The biggest one of them being human nature. I mean, kids, especially the younger ones, are like chickens. 
they just they go. And that's what I that's what I see happening when the bus comes in in the morning is that they go and our professional people spend more of their time, as we talked about like three hours ago, adjusting masks and and policing policy and making things work in order for the model to work. I'm not saying the model can't work, but I think we're going to spend an inordinate amount of time in the classroom being policemen, custodians, and, and, and just trying to trying to take care of, of things so they work the way they're supposed to. I think that we all can see it coming that at some point we're going to be in a remote model. And I, I just, everyone knows that, that in-person learning is better, but I think we're missing an opportunity here to, to pick remote learning from the beginning, spend the time we have to do it and do it right rather than spend the time adjusting the hybrid model so it works right. And inevitably, we know for one reason or another, whether it be influenza or COVID or anything else, we know that the, in, the in-person model is going to have to shut down at some point in time. I would rather have our system spend its time and effort developing the model that we, we know we're going to have to live with from the beginning. If we can go back in the spring semester, God willing, if we can go back to in-person learning, that's fine. But I would hate to give away the month of September and have to shut down after that because I think I think that's that's lost time that we're, that we're not going to get back. So I would rather, as much as it pains me to say that, I will I will vote for remote learning because I think that's where we can put put all of our chips into the game in remote learning and try to get it right. Thanks, Bill. Ashley, Judy. Judy will go. Hi, Judy. Hi. Um, I'm probably going to echo the sentiments that we just heard from Mr. Smith, our esteemed colleague. Um, it's hard to keep the emotional response out of the decision making. There was one letter in particular from one of the um, teachers that struck me um, because he said that he wanted the focus to be on instruction. And I think the hybrid model takes the focus away from instruction in so many uncontrollable ways that I think generally we all agree that we're trying to make up instructional time, that the transition, at, the transition in March and through the remainder of the spring semester was challenging for a lot of different reasons. And I, and I collectively, I think we all have to agree that on some level, all of us are experiencing some level of trauma from the isolation. We're all experiencing anxiety about what the economic situation looks like, what our job situation looks like, um, how the, the mental and the mental health and social emotional um, well-being of our families and our community. Um, I think we all live in that space, and I've I've heard that sentiment echoed over and over again. But for me, the and I did, I thought real hard about this. I read every single letter. I reread some of them. I've talked to um, teachers. I've talked to people in my town. And I think for me to keep the instruction on focus, keep a steady path ahead for our, for our kids and for our communities and for our teachers, um, for me, that's just the best. For me, that's the best plan. That, that is how I ended up on remote. I will end up on remote. Um, instruction, whether the vote goes that way or not, I couldn't really say. Um, but that's that's my thoughts on that. Thanks, Judy. Sure, Bob. And everybody else. Thank you. And Ashley, do you want to say anything? Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Uh, um, I just. Last night, I didn't know what way I was going to vote until the very last minute. Um, I, I'm going to vote for the hybrid. I, I am going to think that that's going to change the way that it's, the way that it's going to be, the way that it's written and the way it's going to be carried out. I think will change in the next couple of weeks where I think numbers are going to grow. Um, I. I voted for the hybrid, although I'm not necessarily sure as a parent that I'm going to send my kids back to school. 
Um, I do worry about kids that haven't had another adult sort, not monitor them, but check in on them, make sure that they're doing okay. Um, I just don't want, you know, kids that, kids that need services not to get them and to fall through the cracks. And I think the, I think if we go full remote, the people that can afford it are going to, you know, hire, um, online tutors or extra help for their kids, which I don't blame them. If I could afford it, I would too. And I think the gap is going to get, um, significantly wider and, um, so I'm taking, um, I don't like either vote, but um, I'm going to vote for the hybrid model. And I think it's going to uh, adapt and change as uh, things come to fruition. And I want to apologize for um, missing the past couple meetings. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not like eating rice and beans, but I got a lot of, I got an old house. I got to fix it up. So I got to take shifts when I can. And that's all I got to say. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. I guess I'm last. You know, I've, I've read, like everybody else here, I've read a lot of letters. I read a lot of letters from teachers from Frontier today. Um, I had two kids go on. I, I said, to, I'll say some of the things I said the other night. I had two kids that graduated from Frontier, 08 and 11. Everybody keeps on asking, especially my Life, why are you on the school committee? Because I love the kids. And I see I see some hardship out there. I see the families that have two working parents. And if kids have to stay home and one parent has to stay home with them and that person loses a job, they don't just lose a job. They may lose their house and lose other things just to make sure their kid gets an education. It may happen. I mean, I'm a high, I'm voting for hybrid and we probably will have to go remote, but hopefully if we do have to go back to remote, that we'll have all the eggs in a, in a row and we won't lose anybody. I've heard things about if somebody doesn't have internet service and I'm not sure how many people here have heard it, that we'll have up, we'll hopefully maybe turn the gym into a, a place where kids could come, big social distancing, but at least they'll have some Wi-Fi where they can come in and learn. Because that was one of my questions I asked, um, I think it was Scott. I said, how many kids do we have? We do have a few kids that do not have internet, and it's really too bad in today's age, but it might be demographics or whatever, but we're not going to lose those kids if we go remote, that we will have a spot for them. Like I said, I think I heard the gym. Also, I asked Darius this week, you know, with everything going on, we must be having some new policies. And he showed me on his on, on one of the desks in his office that there was four or five new policies coming up because with what's going on, we got to have policies in place to protect protect the kids, protect the teachers, protect us as parents and, and the school system. Um, the elementary schools voted the other night. I can't remember how many school committee members are. I should know this, but I think total there's, including us, 20-something. So elementary, there's got to be, Donna, can you help me? Would 18. It be like 15, 18? 18, yeah. So we have 18 school committee members from four towns. And I'm pretty sure everybody passed to have the hybrid at all four elementary schools. And I think out of all the school committee members, and Donna can probably correct me, I think all told, I think there was three that voted no for the hybrid. Um, I just trying to give you just my opinion um but that's you know that's what i can say for my opinion and one other thing keith made a great point the other night he didn't say it tonight but 
that first day when you meet those new kids and they put a face, the kid's face to the teacher's face, he thinks that's worth a million dollars. I said a million dollars. He didn't say it, but I'm going to say it. But So I guess we're to a point where we're going to have to vote on it. Missy? I have a question. Go ahead. If the numbers add up and everybody sticks to what they've said, it sounds like the vote is for hybrid. Am I? I could be miscalculating, but I, I wonder. And I know we still have to do call the vote and everything. I, I have a, a question. I suppose that this is a point of order, and in terms of whether or not we're able to give further requests for the administration to look into if we do vote to go hybrid tonight to to have the pop student population be gradually phased in at a slower rate than, rate than what's recommended. Go ahead, Darius. So, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm, you know, um, just in a really awful, uncomfortable leadership phase because the last thing you want is a, a, a very close to split vote, which is what you have right now. Um, in a very split community. And that's not what you build when you build an educational community. community. And so this is not what I envisioned, you know, um, you know, the state set us up in a way about, you know, you gotta put these kind of different things together to guide our thinking. And then, you know, puts us here in a spot where, you know, um, I didn't predict being, I predict there was gonna be some, some argument, um, but I mean, I mean, Leading into this meeting tonight, I knew it was going to be contentious, just how it built up. But I mean, you know, three weeks ago when we we're putting this together, this is not how I felt. Um, I really, um, if we go to a hybrid vote, um, you know, there's going to be have to be a lot of work, and I have to bring that plan back to the committee to look at again. I think it's going to be there's going to be enough changes in it where it's going to have to be brought before the committee to 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 look at, um, just to I need I need you to scrutinize what we're doing. Um, I also need to uh, have the flexibility because you could vote the plan as is. And then as I forget who mentioned it, you know, if I don't have the teachers on board and not just on board, but feeling safe, you don't have to choose to be bad. They don't feel safe. I don't, you know, I don't want them to be here and not feel safe. So there's a whole kind of an uphill battle of trying to get what we are putting together as a hybrid to be successful because we want um, our teachers to feel safe. We obviously want our parents and students to feel safe and all that kind of stuff. So we, I got to put that all together. And so that's going to cause to get input may cause change into that hybrid model. As someone said, can we move it slower? I imagine that's going to be, uh, you know, on the table, the idea, can we move it slower? And, um, you know, and I have to have the flexibility to do that. You know, if you're looking at, you know, two day orientation, meet at half days and going right into the other thing. I don't see that how that's how this plan is going to be able to move forward effectively. I think the idea is, you know, um, is to build this, you know, with the idea of being fluid, with the idea of maybe we'll only get to half days before we have to go, we have to pull back. But I think the idea within the hybrid was to make that in-person connection. So anyway, I don't want to go back to that, but the that's kind of where I'm seeing it there because there has to be repair within the planning of it because we are a community divided and, um, you know, we've been talking right here very professionally and, um, you know, a you know, very well-functioning board, but social media is probably blowing up right now and they're not as nice. They really aren't. Um, and we need, to, we need to make sure that we keep a community importance there. So I just want to kind of say all, say all that well within that, but I'm going to be coming back in the two weeks. We'll be sitting at another school community meeting. I already, you know, I already mentioned that. We have to do that just because we have to talk about budget stuff as well. Um, and then I think we need to do an update of where we stand with things and what does it look like. The downside of this is that we really put our families in a tough spot because they don't know what their schedule is going to be in September. The upside of it is that we get a better, safer product if we can put more time and get more people involved into it. And so I'm just going to say that you're going to get angry parents um, who are not going to know their work schedules, who are not going to know when their kids are going to go back to any full-time schedule or part-time schedule because I won't be able to release that schedule. And this is both, I'm speaking the elementary as well. Um, on both kind of things, because and that's going to be more frustrating for elementary who got child care issues. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. It is, um, I'm just kind of putting that out there, there. Where I'm at, it's a very difficult spot to be in. 
Thank you. I'm just texting somebody who left the meeting, so I'm trying to make sure everybody's here for the board and stuff. Um, I mean, we're going to, somebody's got to make a motion. And, and then there could be more discussion after somebody makes a motion and seconded. I'd like to make a motion to vote for the hybrid plan this fall. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Keith. Any more, any more discussion? I have a question, Bob. Go ahead, Keith. Whenever we have a closed vote like this, I recall we have to do something like weighted votes. Are we prepared to do that? Because it is going to be closed. No. Yep, we're, we're all set for that. Mary? Um, I had a question for Darius. I had to divert my attention here for a couple of minutes. So I may have missed part of what you said. Do you Did you have a suggestion for how to make this a more cohesive vote? I don't have a way of making a more cohesive vote, but I was talking about the fact that the hybrid model that we've seen presented has a rollout of phase plans that I think are going to be adjusted as we have to work with the teachers to make it, um, I think, probably a slower rollout is what I've been hearing throughout the week and in, in talking with, um, with people. Um, and we may have to change that plan to have a slower rollout. So, but the idea is that the plan is to bring students back so we get the in-person connection, but you may be looking at um, less students being brought in at a time. I'm trying to create more manageable things to help bring the teachers um, being, uh, have a level of comfort and feeling safe within that, within that rollout. That, that's what I was kind of going at. Does that make sense, Mayor? Or no? <laughs> It's hard for me. I, I I I can't easily change my vote. As much as I have great trust in you and your staff, you've got an amazing staff um, and teachers that are working on this. But at this moment, I mean, it's the people inside of that building that are doing the work every day that that don't really support the hybrid. So it's really hard for me. Um, to change my vote at this point. And I wasn't trying to talk people and, and people should not be voting because of, you know, me, I mean, there's a lot of evidence on both pieces here. You know, my job is to present these different models. Okay. And um, I believe the you know, administration um, was, is trying, was trying to get the in-person and my job is to push, um, you know, for those things. And, um, I'm just kind of putting out there that I will be altering this model to try to get it to work with our divided community on that. And so that's what I was, that's what I was kind of, because someone asked about is the model going through as you see it presented, um, you know, and I'm saying I'm going to have to modify that and bring it back in two weeks to show where we're at. Um, I don't think I can go in good faith and try to, there's no way I'm going to get community to come together in any, in any way if it's just, we're going to have a split vote it's going to be off by, it's going to be like a one point difference, you know, um, you know, that's not, you know, we're a community divided. So I'm going to try to figure out how to bring it together. I don't know. That's all I can do. Well, I, I hope, I know, I've heard it from the elementary teachers that they want to work uh, with the administration. And I know the high school teachers really want to work with the administration to make it work. Um, is there any other questions before we uh, we do a roll call vote? Just raise your hand if you want to talk or speak up right now. If not, I'll do a roll call. Lynn? I'm going to stand with the teachers, the parents, the students. I vote remote. Thank you. Damien? Hybrid. Thank you. Missy? No. No? You want remote? Is that what you're saying? That's right. No, no for you. the hybrid. Thank you. Ashley? Uh, I vote hybrid. Thank you. 
Bill? Yes. No, not Phil, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Bill? Remote. Bill, are you still with us? Remote. Thank you. Olivia? Hybrid. Mary? Remote. Judy? Remote. Keith? Yes. Phil? Yes. And myself? Hybrid, yes. I know somebody's got a computer going, either Donna or or Darius. Somebody's got a computer with the weighted vote. Yeah. Donna, you want to get what you have there? I'll let da okay, go ahead, Darius. Well, Donna was the record keeper, as whatever. Whatever. Yeah. We, uh, we have a total of. Um, I'll put it in here so people hear it correctly. So the so the hybrid was six point oh four votes, and the remote was four point nine five. And just for clarification for people who are watching, it's because it's based on population of town. Each vote has a weighted amount to it. Well, I want to thank everybody for their patience of listening to everybody tonight. And um, Bob, if, can I sneak one more comment in before we go? You're 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 allowed more than one if you like. I um. We've been through issues similar to this over the years, and I people who have seen me around have heard this speech before, but we are, 11 of us are together, and there's a code of ethics in the front of that book, okay, that says how school committees operate, and when, even though it was a 65 vote and it was close, when we close down this meeting tonight, the 11 of us have to be all together in this operation, or this is not going to work. Thank you, Bill. Does anybody else have any does anybody else have any closing remarks before we look for a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Oh, somebody, excuse me. Move to adjourn. Before we adjourn, somebody just asked about the how the vote was. In our towns, um, there's different weight per person. Correct, Bill. Yes. Okay. Some towns get a full vote. Some towns, some members get a full vote. Some people get less than a full vote because somebody it's was asking. One man, one vote. Yeah. Yeah. It's not one man, one vote. It's, 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 it's the way somebody came up with it. How many years ago, Bill? Uh, it's got to be about ten now. Okay. Or, or women, okay. just so we're clear. Excuse me. <laughs> women, so we're clear. One person, one person vote. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> so I have a motion to adjourn from Bill. Who else is going to second it? Second. And roll call, Lynn. Yep. Damien. Yep. Missy. Yes. Ashley. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Livia? I saw her here somewhere. Livia, did you leave us? Mary? Yes. Judy? Yeah. Keith? Yes. And Phil? Yes. And myself, yes. Good night, everybody. <laughs>